back to the Video Essay Podcast, a show featuring conversations with leading practitioners of videographic criticism. I'm your host, Will DeGravio, and on today's show, I sit down with John Gibbs and have a special conversation with Douglas Pye. Now, I want to make very clear from the outset, and you will know this as you listen to the episode, that while I could have interviewed John and Doug together, because as many of you know, they are great collaborators. They have collaborated together on a number of scholarly articles, they've co-edited book series, and yes, they have created together a handful of audiovisual essays. But I speak to each individually. I talk with John in the usual format that you've grown accustomed to on the Video Essay Podcast. We talk about his background, dive into one of his video essays in depth, and discuss two video essays made by two other leading practitioners of the form, Patrick Keating and Liz Green. With Doug, we talk about the work of Victor Perkins. More specifically, we discuss the new book, V.F. Perkins on Movies, Collected Shorter Film Criticism, edited by Doug Pye. Before we begin, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to the podcast's free weekly newsletter, Notes on Videographic Criticism, which you can do at thevideoessay.substack.com. Additionally, please follow us on Twitter at The Video Essay and on Facebook, The Video Essay Podcast. And as I have mentioned before, please consider donating to my new Patreon page. As I've mentioned, Everything I create will always remain 100% free. However, if you want to help keep the lights on, if you believe in what I do, want to see me keep doing more, please consider donating. Uh, And again, links to my Patreon and a whole lot more can be found at thevideoessay.com. And now, here are my conversations with John Gibbs and Doug Pye. And now I am incredibly pleased to be joined by someone who I think was the last person that I extended an invitation to to come on this podcast before the U.S. and the U.K. were thrown into quarantine. I think if we go back to our emails, they're literally like the last week of February, the first week of March 2020. So an interesting uh, document there. Um, John Gibbs, who is a professor at Reading in the U.K., audiovisual essayist, scholar of film style and many other things that we will get into during this conversation. But John. It's just so great to finally have you before me on Zoom um, so that we can talk. Uh, Welcome to the Video Essay Podcast. (laughs) Thanks very much, Will. It's great to be here. And as you say, great to finally get together and have the conversation. It's really good. Yeah, maybe maybe the fact that we were finally able to get together is some good mojo that the universe is starting to realign and things maybe will be going back to a little bit normal. I don't know, I'll knock on knock on some wood there. But um for someone listening in and you're very well known in the in the video essay world and particularly the academic video essay world. But for someone who maybe is you know, maybe coming from the non-academic space, um could you give us just a quick introduction of who you are, what your scholarly interests are out outside of videographic criticism and also give us kind of your origin story we call it on the show how did, how did you get interested in videographic criticism thanks so well yeah no well I'm a, I'm an academic um I'm teach film in as you say at University of Reading I'm actually the head of the School of Arts and Communication Design at the moment so that's the Department of Film Theatre and Television which is uh, one of the longest standing British um film departments and has been teaching theatre a bit longer uh, and obviously television as well these days um and also together with a Department of Typography and Graphic Communication and Reading School of art and uh, so quite an exciting creative community to be working in um, but also of course especially during times of Covid um, plenty to be engaged with there in terms of finding imaginative ways of working with our students under the constraints of the day and making sure everyone has the best experience possible. So that's the kind of context. Um, with the, one of the interesting things about Reading is that it's always been very interested in how to bring critical, theoretical, historical approaches together with practice and it's been one of its great strengths and in fact I was an undergraduate in that department myself I originally went to Reading to study zoology and psychology and ended up changing over to film and drama as it was then called and um, done quite a few other things in the meantime but never looked back and always uh, you know had such an amazing 
uh, educational experience myself, um, I've always been quite inspired by trying to create a similar kind of context for the students of today. Um, the other thing to say about the Reading tradition is part of that mixture of practice and, and, and critical thinking, which obviously does relate to audiovisual essays and videographic criticism. But the other interesting thing about it is that it's got a great tradition of basing discussion about all the interesting ways you might want to talk about film, theatre or television, but grounding that discussion in the material features of the works of art, in the decisions made by filmmakers and theatre makers and television makers, and finding interesting ways of moving the discussion between those things. So that's partly what inspired me, um, perhaps because of that scientific background, I don't know. But, you know, I was always interested in the evidence-based approach to thinking about art, if that makes sense. I really, I actually went there because I was more interested in theatre, but as things went along, I got more and more interested in the quality of the traditions of film criticism we're engaging with and how precisely you could think about the relationships between filmmakers' choices and meaning in a whole variety of senses and, 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 and how is that's interesting as a critic, but also how that might help you become a more interesting filmmaker too. Um, after a few years of running a production company and a, a video essay label, I came back to Reading actually to do a PhD on mise-en-scene um, under the supervision of Doug Pye, who I think you're going to be talking to soon on the podcast. And again, that was because of that interest of thinking about style and its consequences and how that worked. Um, so I'd been and I've been interested in writing that kind of work and I've been doing that kind of work. And and as video essays began to appear, I began to think, well, this is a, a logical extension of that kind of interest. And, and f if I was to describe my research, I'd say it's around extending the methods and the subjects of style-based criticism and what could be a more interesting way of extending those methods than to get into um, videographic criticism. So I'd, I'd reckon I could see what an exciting thing it was to do. I could see how it was going to give great potential for getting closer to the material and bringing argument and evidence together in new and exciting ways. But I was also on the runaround. I had, you know, to, time was one of the things I needed and an opportunity. Um, so I was lucky enough to um, be one of the first um, people on the first scholarship in, in sound and image at Middlebury College in 2015. There were a number of things that were amazing about that opportunity. And you know that experience well yourself, I know. But the design of the workshop is fantastic. Um, Chris and, and Jason bring it alive in really brilliant ways and I know it comes out of some of Chris's teaching traditions before that. The group of people who you're lucky enough to be with and, and I was with a fantastic group of scholars from uh, around North America and Europe working on on, uh, on that first workshop uh, so that was a fantastic part of the experience but equally just the time to stop I was head of department those days stop being head of department for two weeks settle down in this amazing creative space on the half empty well, filled up with language scholars, of course, but the Middlebury campus to work um, with great support, great dialogue, and just to have the space to make that transition into the videographic world. And as as you know yourself, the, the technological barrier isn't anything to be frightened of, I think. We've got lots of great examples of self-taught video essayists out there, um, including some of the most best known. Um, but the key thing is having, you know, it was actually having the space, uh, the time and the space and the environment to become a student again. And to get stuck into to the work and that was what got me up and running as it were. I totally agree with you there. We always address on this podcast the person out there who wants to make a video essay but hasn't yet and a lot of times I think it is that technical logical barrier and I think and I think you would agree with this based on what you just said is that I the video essay audience is maybe the least judgmental when it comes to quality of any audience that I've ever encountered and I think it's more that when the production quality is really high we we praise that and we're like wow this is such a beautifully done piece but when it's perhaps less technologically advanced it's just okay well now I'm going to focus more on the argumentative you know side of this video exactly and um yeah as we're agreeing it's it's a lot easier than it looks and I, I remember I mean one of the one of the visiting scholars who joined us during that in the second week of the workshop um I, I knew Katie Grant already but um and um as as you know she's such a great an encourager of other people's work but um I remember being struck by one of the things she said then was that up until that point she'd made almost all of of her work on iMovie and again that's part of what's so exciting about this moment in time is that well back when I was an undergraduate we used to make our films on two machine VHS or SVHS editing suites and every time you made a cut you lost a generation and those machines cost £20,000 and if you wanted to do an, an online edit in um, Betacam SP you had to pay £120 an hour to get into a big space that looked like the control deck of the Starship Enterprise and all the rest of it and nowadays you can buy 
buy well you can even buy an ipad and a phone and have something that's more powerful in terms of its editing and, and indeed filming ability let alone um you know the fact that you could got access to that kind of opportunity and indeed a non-linear experience on a domestic computer is transformative um same it, it really is and i think we're seeing this in particular i don't know if you've seen this video and uh, it's been making the rounds on the rise of film TikTok and thinking about TikTok as a form of uh, film criticism. Keyline Meadows is the creator of this video, and it's really just going to, goes to show everything that you're saying that our the increase in the capabilities of our technology are opening up all these doors to film criticism. And that in in five years, video essay may look like it's old and clunky and too many steps for film criticism. So so who knows where it's going to go. But when we when we had the opportunity to apply for that first Middlebury workshop, um, you were invited to talk about different reasons why you would be a good person to be, um, you know, selected if you were lucky enough to get there. And one of the things points I felt immediately was that our students would be in a particularly good place to do this kind of work. And I know that Chris and Jason were thinking about, or I learnt afterwards anyway, they were thinking about how can this experience gets seeded further who who can we who can we invite to this workshop who will then take those skills and disseminate them in a wider context and i always felt that the students at reading would be particularly well positioned to do that and and so it's proved so i've been teaching videographic criticism in different ways for a number of years now and the quality of the student work has been extremely exciting and they've really relished that opportunity to to articulate their ideas in you know don't get me wrong i love i love beautifully crafted writing on the page and, and capturing the ways in which films work in terms of writing but it's also very exciting to give people other ways of articulating that understanding and, and some students have really well many students have really run with that opportunity and done some great work and I think that is one thing that I really admire about their approach is this emphasis on not only training scholars to do this themselves but then being able to have the tools to go back to their institutions and do that because that's ultimately how this i guess grows <laughs> you need to create the demand in a sense if, uh for teach for scholars who are producing this work themselves so it, it, all, it all makes sense but there's one thing i want to i want to circle back to that you mentioned in is that you mentioned it quickly do you have a, pr a background in film production and did you say that you were involved in video essay production and before you started your PhD what was what was that no that was just that was more corporate and training and uh, that kind of video production but also a video label so I and a couple of graduates from the course set up a video label and released a collection of um, Italian westerns back in the early 90s on VHS just before DVD and more importantly just before the World Wide Web made it uh, much easier to reach uh, an international enthusiast audience for spaghetti westerns but we did some great things and so do you, do you see the work that you did there as influencing uh, your approach to videographic criticism at all? Well, I've always been interested in that crossover between film criticism and filmmaking. And as a student, I was really passionate about it. And the reason we set up the production company is because we wanted to move on to make it more exciting things than just corporate work. But we were in the middle of a, a recession, the early 90s recession, and it wasn't the easiest time to get going. And after a while, I thought, well, you know, doing a bit too much business here and a bit less creative bit less creative work than I'd like um, so um, I've always enjoyed the critical side of thinking about film as well so I'll go and do a PhD and began to build up my teaching experience while I was doing that um, but my first full-time job was at LCP and that was on a film production course um, and I, I, I was quite proud of I was known there as the the critic who understands practice which I took as a great uh, badge of honour given that most of my colleagues were practitioners um, and I was also known as an honorary technician by some of my technical colleagues on in that department so both of those were badges of honour for me but equally I was t teaching an environment where everybody on that course was looking forward to uh, becoming a filmmaker um, but they could really see the value of a mise-en-scene type of approach to thinking about film as a way of understanding the medium understanding its possibilities understanding its traditions and therefore something that they needed to know in order to become um, better filmmakers themselves and that thinking about their stylistic choices you know studying the stylic cho stylistic choices of others informed their own opportunity to make stylistic choices and that's very much the sort of reading tradition and it was great to go back to reading a few years later than that and mid well, 2006 i started back at reading and again bringing those two things together has always been important so i think all of those things put me in a good position to enjoy videographic criticism myself if that makes sense absolutely and i want to really drill down on this and that is that your your written scholarship 
leadership is has been primarily concerned or not maybe not primarily but heavily concerned with this notion of film style what is film style because i think it's a phrase that feels very in- intuitive when you think about it but of course it's the subject of countless books and articles and debates and everything and so i'm i'm not asking you to you know litigate that entire field of study in this podcast but give us a sense of what film style is and and you've already alluded to this why why is videographic criticism such a great avenue for those who are interested in studying and talking about film style? Well, style is a word with a lot of baggage. Um, and, you know, some of that's really helpful and, and, and not always. And it's a word with lots of different meanings. And I've just picked up a copy of Style and Meaning, the edited collection I did with Doug, because in the introduction, we say something like, well, quoting, there are 28 different definitions of the word style, the noun style in the Oxford English Dictionary. So that gives you a flavour of quite how much, a, like any term, it's accumulated lots of different associations through time. I think the way I'm most interested in articulating it is in terms of thinking about the means of expression rather than the subject. I think style is always related to meaning and in the most interesting films uh, in complex ways But you and it's impossible to think about meaning without thinking about style but in focusing on style um, that's the way to open up these things in the most exciting way. So um, it's thinking about the how rather than the what and it's thinking about all those decisions that filmmakers make in terms of camera position, movement, colour sound design elements of performance decor or the full range of expressive means that filmmakers have at their disposal and paying attention to those and thinking about the choices that filmmakers have made and then how those choices what what's gained by doing it this way what's what's interesting about the choices that have been made and and what are the consequences of those choices so you could say you know style is something like the you know the product of filmmakers choices but the emphasis is absolutely on the how and how things were created and how things were expressed as it were I think that given the picture that you've just painted us there, we can imagine why the form of videographic criticism is so suitable for the study of film style, style, because this is the phrase Christian Keithley uses, you know, whereas film literature scholars could always just quote the text that they were talking about, we can now quote using images and sounds. I can imagine that it's very much the case where you are writing about a specific film or a specific scene or even a specific shot. And in in writing, you get to be perhaps a little bit more selective in, in what you talk about, right? Like it's easier to ignore something in a scene in writing, um, whether intention, like intentionally ignoring it or unintentionally ignoring it. Whereas in videographic criticism, if you have the scene on screen, like the person as they're engaging with your critical argument is also seeing the image. And so it's easier to see if you've A, made a mistake, B, left something out, C, uh, just just missed something entirely. And I'm wondering, do you feel a heightened sense of pressure when you are working with videographic criticism in in a way, and I, and I don't mean this like in a malicious way, and I don't mean this directed just at you either, but just in general, does audiovisual criticism make the critic better by forcing them to be continuously confronted with the image as they're making and presenting their argument. Okay, so lots of good points there, Will. You're absolutely right in thinking that one of the great things about videographic criticism is that you're that much closer to the material itself. So it's easier to bring it to your um, to the person you're conversing with attention. But equally, and as you say, Chris Keithley is very eloquent about this, you can begin to use the form itself in order to make the argument and you're not just reliant on a process of translation into another medium. So that is very exciting. Going back to your question about uh, the immediacy of the images and sounds in front of you and, and I think in written criticism we still have maybe it's even more difficult the other way around that we've got more of a burden of responsibility on us as critics to be true to what we're describing and interpreting on the page than we do as um, videographic critics obviously there's a process of selection there and obviously any description that we might write is, is going to have certain emphases and certain perspectives which are drawn out but it's also even very important not to be disingenuous, not to be selective and ignore things that don't fit in with your argument. So maybe it's easier to keep honest, as it were, with the material in front of you. But equally, film is so complex that you can go over the same piece of footage several times in a video essay and draw out new things. So both the act of description is still important. Pointing things to the attention of your viewer and listener is very important. But equally, there's so much packed in there that even at the descriptive level, there are things that 
um, you're going to need to help bring out, even if it's playing in front of um, the person who's consuming the essay at the same time. Absolutely. I've been bringing up this quote often lately because it relates to something that I'm working on now. So it's totally like self-centered why I'm bringing it up. And maybe you can help me work through some things here. But I know that you're a devotee, as so many people are, of Robin Wood. And at the beginning of his essay on Rear Window and Hitchcock's films, he begins it by saying, you know, I haven't seen Rear Window in a while. Um, I haven't been able to find a, like a, a copy of it. I apologize for any mistakes that I might make in this essay. And because I'm relying on my memory and notes I scribbled in the movie theater. I love this. This is like my favorite thing. I, I always come back to videographic criticism because because I just imagine would Robin Wood be like a video essayist if he were ar- alive today? And I so wish he was. And I'm just wondering what, what you think about that, what you think about the quote in relation to what you're sa- we're saying, leaving it pretty open-ended and let you, <laughs> letting you run with it. Well, there is a very interesting history there. Um, and as you rightly observe, um, access to materials. I mean, it is extraordinary that Robin Wood can write with such precision about those movies um, at the time. And, and some of them had been withdrawn from circulation, as, as I'm sure you're aware. And it was impossible to see a number of those films right through till the 70s. When you speak to Doug, you might ask him about the black and white 16 millimeter print of Vertigo, which was the only thing you could see through a large part of the 60s in the UK. So none of that sense of colour and all the rest of it. So there were some both there some interesting distribution issues, but also just the ability to um, engage with detail was it was such so much more difficult to do in the mid 60s than it is today. Um, I think we're going to say a few words about movie, a journal of film criticism in a bit. But in in the audio visual essay, in the audio visual essay, a section of the website, um, I wrote a few words that captured a flavour of that history. Um, I interviewed Ian Cameron as part of my PhD um, a few years when in the late 90s, and he spoke really beautifully about the challenges the movie critics had running around from cinema to cinema, chasing a print around the outskirts of London, probably a print that was damaged and some of the reels might be in the wrong order, trying to, even a new release film, having to go to see it multiple times over. He talks about seeing La Ventura seven times times or something trying to write about it and then of course as you probably experience writing notes in the dark is a very difficult thing to do so there were real material challenges there and the quality of the detail of writing like Woods and like VF Perkins and Ian Cameron's and the other critics at that stage who were trying to be honest and and trying to capture the detailed texture of the films they were writing about is incredible and remarkable. There's then a, the history in the UK anyway shifts as some people begin to get jobs in higher education. So Victor Perkins gets a job at Bullmarsh College of Higher Education, which becomes part of the University of Reading is basically my department. He comes there and he one of the things he's delighted in, or in fact, even before that, the BFI, he's getting excited about working on flatbed editing tables and getting to experience the material in new ways. Laura Mulvey has been very articulate about when she came to Bullmarsh, um, succeeding Victor when he went off to found the department at Warwick but you know enjoying the opportunity to work with material in new ways and she's spoken and written about that previously and of course Laura has also spoken very eloquently about the new possibilities that in that case DVD technology but all these things are linked so you get to the point where you can start building up a VHS library then DVDs come along with a greater kind of picture quality and an ability to pause or to rewind as as she's written about in various places Uh, and then of course in a way videographic criticism is is a logical extension of that and and many of your previous guests I know have have talked uh, with enthusiasm about the ways working with an editing working with a film or television program within the editing software gives you new ways of understanding it and new ways of uh, appreciating it so it is both in terms of your ability to see and to listen and to capture accurately um, it's the sort of apotheosis of that trajectory and I'm sure the early um, movie critics and Robin Wood would have greatly enjoyed having access to this kind of technology at the time and of course there's that famous occasion when they managed to get Minnelli to sit down and look at the um, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse um, and um, it doesn't necessarily go in as well as it should have done Victor told me that you know he said well maybe maybe Minnelli wasn't the best person to work with for this kind of thing and, and maybe the setup with the room was wrong because we were in a viewing theatre and we were all sitting in rows rather than in a nice conversational environment and, and maybe even then when you, you still don't have the full control to look at the texture and the detail of something and 
play and rewind you know maybe they could have had an even more interesting conversation with Manelli but of course it's a, a touch point and is ridiculed by um by the the newspaper critics and or newspaper reviewers you might say the people who are skeptical that you could sensibly look at a popular Hollywood movie in that kind of detail um that that was a point of ridicule and, and of course Ian Cameron comes back with a fine article arguing why these things were worth asking why they were sensible questions to ask of both Manelli and the and the film itself Thank you for that history. I'm just imagining these critics you mentioned, Wood, Mulvey, all these others, sitting in a theater, maybe watching a re-release of Vertigo, whatever, knowing, okay, I, I want to write about this. I want to bring something out of this. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to pay as close attention as I possibly can to everything in the image. And I imagine it must be some type of, there must be a lot of pressure associated with that, right? Because you might say, okay, I want to talk about this shot specifically. So I'm going to sit here waiting until that shot comes up on the screen. So I better not sneeze. I better not like, (laughs) you know, do anything. And I imagine that must be what is at the root of a lot of this close analysis and this detailed criticism. And in a way that must feed it, right? And so I wonder if in videographic criticism, in a way, yes, we are able to really manipulate the image and get closer to it and rewatch it all the time and look for little things. But have we lost something along the way as it relates to the, the the scarcity of images? Like, are we spoiled? Do we, because we have far greater access to things like Hitchcock or whomever, are we not looking as closely because we always have access to them? Um, I think there are a few few interesting questions bound up there. Um, if you were Robin Wood trying to write Hitchcock's films revisited, or rather Hitchcock's films, not the revisited part at all, the, the original 1965 book, part of the context there was that they believed and I think have been fully vindicated that to say anything sensible about Psycho or Vertigo or Rear Window you need to be really attuned to the detail of how that thing is expressive and they were writing in a culture where and in a way it's still true you know there aren't many places unless you're lucky enough to perhaps watch a good audiovisual essay or or, or pick up a copy of Hitchcock's films or engage in in some of the places where you can find a really substantive criticism um but our discourse in 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 the newspapers, certainly in the UK, I can't speak for the states, but there's still a sense of which reviewing happens at a very superficial level, and it was significantly worse, I think, in the 60s than it is today. But early movie critics are really strong on what they think are the shortcomings of the existing criticism that it's that it's trying to talk about films, but it just doesn't have the critical tools to engage with what makes them interesting, and and it's particularly a case, of course, for them because they're looking at the popular movies of the day um you know nobody was nobody was in debate about whether Ingmar Bergman was a significant artist but if you were talking about Howard Hawks there was much more of a question to be had or um Minnelli or whoever it might be so particularly as popular American movies work particularly beautifully through the way they orchestrate their mise-en-scene and their soundtracks if you can't get access to that then you will you might just go away thinking it's just a cowboy film or a or a you know a schlocky horror film or a thriller it's you know it's it's not making great claims to importance but of course the richness and the complexity is there and actually i think we do experience those things as viewers whether we've read that criticism or not i think our our viewing experience is much more complex than is ever captured in the kind of media discourse around film going or television viewing Um, and I think all of us when we're watching a film have a really sophisticated engagement with all those thousands of channels of communication that we're engaging with at the time but it's just very difficult to put that into words and if you've got a sort of you know, if there's a cultural barrier that's stopping you from looking seriously at Vertigo um, and and think being prepared to think about it seriously, there's every chance that you'll completely fail to notice what's interesting about it um, in those terms. I think we talk a lot about the the benefits of being able to put whatever film you want into Premiere and being able to look at it closely. But are there are there are there downsides to that? And I think there and I, I think there are obvious ones. You know, you're not in a movie theater, for one. Um, So you're not looking at the image perhaps the way it was supposed to be. But, you know, if you look at a Criterion Blu-ray on a good computer screen, I guess that's pretty good. But I I guess I'm just curious about that. And I hadn't really thought of it really until our until sitting down here right now with you. (laughs) No, it's a good question. So, yeah, I missed that part. What's the is there a downside? Um, um, Yes, there may be downsides of different kinds. um, But it's also the case that perhaps not 
it's interesting that there wasn't more of uh, an engagement um, with the detail of films in the intervening period between the point where VHS became a format which people could use. I mean, obviously, a VHS of, of Vertigo is, is in no way remotely comparable to the experience of seeing it in the cinema, but at least you've got the thing in front of you. I mean, we have seen a big revival, as it were, of, of close analysis or in people being in keen to engage with the detail of films but it doesn't map very closely onto the emergence of the technologies that would have made that a lot more easy to do although it does enable one to to do all kinds of analytical things that wouldn't have been possible and, and i guess if you were to look at someone like victor's victor perkins's work you can see that there is a difference in some of his, the detail of his later criticism compared to the, the things he was writing when the film was at one remove. Again, that doesn't really answer your question in terms of the downside. I'm not sure there is a downside in having access to these things um, and being able to... I think the bigger downside is actually around the fact that there are no films on telly anymore and that it's amazing. You can call up a Barbara Stanwyck film from the 1930s uh, and get it delivered to you the next day in a way that just wasn't possible even um, even 50, 20 years ago. You know, it was completely impossible to do it. Certainly when I was running my video label, you couldn't get access to materials like that but what you did get when you were growing up then was you got to see all those movies there in the uk there were four channels three channels four channels five channels there were something like seven films a day on bbc2 and channel four in the early 90s playing all through the night if you came home after a nice evening out and slumped down in front of the telly you didn't spend the next hour and a half endlessly flicking through all the satellite channels you had a choice of about two or three things and you found yourself watching that movie that you'd never thought you know maybe it was an interesting japanese movie or French New Wave or whatever it might have been an interesting African movie was playing on middle of the night you'd find yourself watching that and engaging with that and you you would have grown up in a culture where there were opportunities to watch movies of the past every day matinees on Saturday and Sunday afternoons and uh, I don't know what it's like um, where you're living at the moment Will but in the UK even on the sort of dedicated film channels there's a very limited selection of movies so unless you've got the bug and unless you've learnt about all those different kinds of cinema from different places and different times, you don't have the incentive to go and hunt them out. No, I think you're absolutely right. And that's been my experience too. I'm only, the only, there's no randomness anymore. Uh, I, there's only curating my own watching. And I mean, the closest I get is to scrolling through whatever streaming app I'm going through and saying, oh, that, that looks interesting. But more often it's like I'm going through the Criterion app or Netflix or whatever. And I see something and I say, oh, John Gibbs told me that that movie was good. So he told me I should watch that. So I'm going to watch that. And that's not the same experience as as what you're describing. And I think for me, I come from this, like I'm the last, I think my age bracket maybe is the last that can remember going to a place like Blockbuster and getting a VHS, right? Like I have a sister who's a few years younger than me. I don't think she remembers that. So in a way, I've always been lucky to have access to, to so many things. Maybe that's why I'm more like focused on, is there a downside to this, blah, blah, whereas I don't have that perspective of having no access to anything. So I can't I can't fully appreciate it in, in the way that a lot of people can. It was certainly a really exciting experience suddenly being able to get to see these films that you might have read about in an issue of early movie or whatever it might be, or things that you'd read about in different parts of film studies. And suddenly you could see them, you could find them, you could own them. Not that I want to overdo the whole owning side of it, but I do think it's very nice to have a whole library of your stuff. But more importantly, they're in great condition. And there was this interesting program at one point in the in the 90s, uh, which was run by the European Union, where they restored um, a series of movies and made them available um, in better conditions and not their full widescreen format. So when Doug and I started writing about Bonjour Tristesse, we were able to see it was on television in 16 by 9, which is obviously not its full ratio, which is probably 1 to 2.35. Um, but it was a hell of a lot better than 1 to 1.33. So we were beginning to, I mean, Doug might have seen it at the time, I'm not sure, but um, to be able to see it was very exciting. To be able to see more of the original uh, framing was exciting. And then obviously to be able to buy a DVD and, and now a Blu-ray, which captures the whole of the frame and, and, a, and a blu-ray does hold up pretty well to projection in my experience you can get a pretty decent image you know it's not the same as film of course but it, i'm happy i'm happy to have got there to say the least but there was an exciting moment where all these films i mean you probably had this experience in your studies too reading about these titles on films and thinking oh i must see that one i've got, I've got to find out you know i need to catch up with that at some point in that film and then suddenly you know there was a period when unless it happened to turn up on telly uh you you couldn't see it i remember going to see madame de you 
without subtitles, obviously, in Paris and being very excited. And, and Jim Hillier, who is another one of the scholars I was lucky enough to study with, I remember him remarking on how the, the British television premiere of Madame de was at about five o'clock in the morning on Channel 4 um, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s. You know, so you were at the mercy of what um, some imaginative um, programmers on the television channels had for you. But suddenly, yeah, we can, we can experience these films and a range of films that would have been very difficult to see through different kinds of film history and from different places. But as, we, as we're agreeing, you've got to have learnt that cinema is more than what the Netflix algorithm will throw up in front of you when you sit down in front of the telly. A slightly related topic, and this is something I think, again, I'm personally very excited about by videographic criticism, and I think the video essays, if I had to pick a genre of video essay that I love the most, it's ones that focus on individual film moments that take a few seconds of a film and really just rip it apart, expand it, and then kind of use it to look at the film or film history or whatever as a whole. I can think of, if we look at an example of a canonical video essay or a video essay that a lot of people have seen, Pass the Salt by Christian Keithley. We'll talk about Liz Green's video essay later, which is just a single breath (laughs) from a film that was actually removed, so it's not even in the film, um, that is then used to do a 25-minute video essay on David Lynch's The Elephant Man. So this is very exciting, but there is a tradition in written film criticism, and you contribute an an essay to a wonderful volume on film moments for the BFI that I love. That's all these short essays by critics on individual film moments. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, and could you just give us a sense of what what do we mean when we say a film moment? And it seems to me that videographic criticism is the perfect, perfect venue for this. I think because it just allows us to just expand and draw on other things that perhaps you couldn't, you can get a self-contained piece of scholarly work out of a video essay that might be a little bit harder to do in a in written criticism. Um, do you find that to be the case? Yeah, interesting. I'm, you're right. I'm absolutely drawn to the idea of looking at moments. And, uh, and that's because I think a good exploring an exciting moment not only enables you to get to the full richness of what's in that moment um, and mean, we'll come on to the very good example of Liz's essay a bit later on as you say where she's able to take one tiny element and, and build up to a much greater kind of a, 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 an interesting film history from that point but thinking about it in perhaps in a slightly more um, in the traditions of detailed criticism what a moment gives you is a chance to explore the complexity of what's going on in, in that moment but equally it's a way of then being able to talk about the wider film so if you can do justice to the moment and you've chosen the right moment that and then enables you to think about how that moment relates to all the others and what patterns might be intersecting with your own particularly chosen moment and um, it's a really good basis both to try and capture that complexity of the way that films um, such as the ones explored in that book address you um, but equally it it you if you do justice to one small part of it then your reader or viewer in a videographic sense can then go on and explore those same questions um, in relation to the rest of the film or they can test your idea and if you're suggesting these things are important a they can test your ideas against their experience of that moment and that bit of the film but they can also then take their take those ideas and think about the rest of the movie in the light of that so I think it's a very good strategy to follow it's worth just mentioning that one of the nice thing about Tom and James's uh, book the film moments book is that they deliberately invited its contributors to write about moments at, I think it was two and a half thousand words but they were asking for people to write the same length as a typical undergraduate essay so part of the form of the book was to to, to demonstrate or to be useful to to students in thinking about what they might be able to do in handling a film moment it's a truly fantastic book. I discovered it when I I didn't know how to. I knew that I was interested in this film moments and videographic criticism, or what I, I don't even think I was calling it film moments, but I was just interested of the in the work of people like Johannes Binotto and, and things like that, trying to think about it. And then I, d- I found this book and was blown away by it and, it, and it, and it really helped me. I would definitely recommend video essayists. Go, go check it out. There's a lot you can take away from it. And I also think that in, in talking with people who make audiovisual essays, I think sometimes it's... In, in thinking about when you're about to start a project, in a sense, it's very easy to think, okay, I have this two and a half hour film that I now need to talk about in seven minutes, in eight minutes. And I actually think if you think of the film moment can actually be a really good way to start perhaps in a, in a first audiovisual essay, because you can say, no, I'm not going to think about the film as a whole. I'm going to think about 12 seconds or I'm going to think about two minutes and then I'm going to expand out. And I think it's a really great way to kind of think through audiovisual criticism. 
Absolutely right. Um, it was, I was dipping into um, your uh, conversation with Adrian Martin and Christine Alvarez earlier in the, and he talks, of course, a very experienced person of doing DVD commentaries, and he talks about the difference between doing a DVD commentary, whereas as opposed to an audio visual essay, where you can focus on that moment and you can go back to it and you can expand it and you can, as opposed to having disappeared over the hill and rushed out of sight, and you're still trying to catch up in a DVD commentary, you can really begin to focus. I mean, the other another of the essays we're going to be talking about a bit later on Patrick Keating's one on Magnificent Ambersons is another amazing example of that because he takes a very short montage sequence exactly the kind of moment that you might well overlook or forget about in your viewing it seems to be relatively minor it's not one of the fancy bits of the film and he then expands that in really interesting ways which include giving you an understanding of the whole film partly through its difference from lots of the more famous sequences of the movie indeed it it really is and I think I you know that's one of those moments that you might exactly you might overlook or you might for one second go oh this is kind of cool this is kind of interesting and then you leave the theater and you go on I think videographic criticism encourages you to say when you say oh that's interesting or oh that that made me laugh or that's really that that's really frightening or or whatever the videographic criticism tells you go there that's that's where you should go don't don't necessarily worry about the things that are right in your face or that are meant to be seen as the most important those are valuable too of course but it's the little things that's unique to you that I think is so compelling that's that's true and that's there in as you say in past the salt which is one of the first examples of a of a video essay which does this kind of work but equally it's part of the impulse of quite a lot of written criticism too so we might think of stanley cavell and his response to particular moments and um again you might point at the way in which quite a bit of victor perkins writing takes some seemingly inconsequential detail and then helps you to get a much greater understanding of of what's at stake in the whole film. Absolutely. And my conversation with Doug will be in the episode after this um, because I'm recording it after. So now I'll be able to follow up with him on the things that you're mentioning. But I'd like you to describe your involvement with the journal movie. And because I believe this, the the iteration of the journal you have is a revival of a previous form of of the journal um, that Victor Perkins and others were very much associated with. And we may have already alluded to some of these questions, but how does the work of audiovisual criticism work within the form of the journal, because I think it's very interesting. Folks listening in may be familiar with a place like In Transition, uh, which is a journal of audiovisual criticism. But Movie is still publishes written scholarship and then has a video essay section. And so, John, could you talk a little bit about the interplay between those two and also how they fit into the history of Movie more generally? Yeah, sure. I'll do my best. So, um, as you rightly say, well, um, Movie, a journal of film criticism, is a sort of a, a reimagining or, or a successor to the original movie. The original movie first published in 1962. It got through, I can't remember exactly how many, but most of its, and a large number of its issues in that first 12 months. It then appeared rather intermittent periods through the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, and then had its last issue in 2000. But that was only its 36th issue over a more than 36 year period. Um, And there are a number of reasons for that, I think, including the challenges of running a small print-based journal, economically speaking, and the challenges of doing that while you're doing other commitments. And, and perhaps also that writing detailed criticism takes quite a long time to get it right. You know, it's not the sort of stuff you can just knock off the top of the head, or certainly most people can't do that. I certainly can't do that. Um, and I'm sure most people can't. So, um, but so yeah, it has this um, very important role in establishing the significance of um, film in UK culture and, and mise-en-scene as a, as a way of thinking about popular movies and style-based detailed criticism as a way of engaging with that and establishing the importance of those um, films and what they mean and why that matters to us um, in, in a detailed way that, that helped to set up, yeah, help set up film culture and film studies in the UK and internationally. So that it's a really important journal from a historical point of view. I was delighted when Ed Galifant, um, uh, who tried, reassembled members, existing members of the original um, editorial board, like Doug Pye, Michael Walker, Jim Hillier, um, Victor Perkins um, and Ed himself, plus um, a number of people who were interested in that tradition, me, Andrew Clevin, James McDowell and, and Lucy Fife Donaldson were also involved in the relaunch. Um, and he invited us to come and think about what reviving movie might look like. Um, Ian Cameron was uh, was alive at that point, but died sadly soon afterwards. And the first issue is something of a tribute to him. 
Um, although he wasn't, he'd given us his blessing, but he wasn't going to be directly involved in this project um, at that time. Um, and Ed and I um, edited the first issue and got it up and running with um, James and Lucy's help um, in different kinds of ways. So that was the relaunch. And we decided to make it an open access, um, free uh, digital production. And it's it's going strong. Um, it now has a rolling issue structure. I know there's some another video essay and some more articles are about to appear um, in the next couple of weeks on the website so that's exciting it seemed to make a lot of sense i mean video essays that are engaged in style-based criticism it wasn't difficult to persuade the other members of the editorial board that this is something that we should be doing um there's not every kind of video essay that would fit into um into movie and would be successful through the peer review process but anything that's engaged in that kind of approach and has got something interesting to say about the object of study and how it relates to other questions in film is- history aesthetics and criticism is the sort of thing that the board is interested in looking at so you'll see um so basically it just seemed like a really logical extension of of movies ambitions and and as we were saying earlier going back to the days when you had to run around between cinemas to try and capture the detail of things it was nice to be able to 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 bring work that has a strong link to the movie tradition, but also has the advantages and excitements of being um, a, an audiovisual essay um, to the journal. So, um, yeah, colleagues were quite happy to add that section once they'd seen some of the stuff Doug and I had been up to anyway. Let's put it that way. Now, let us transition to talking about the video essay that you made. Say, have you seen the karaoke, which is a perfect example of a video essay that really is aimed towards, I think, teaching people and exposing them to something that they have probably never seen before. And I think is really just such a brilliant example of how video essay can reach people and share an aspect of film history or criticism um, that they may may not have otherwise um, known about or encountered and really point us in a direction to learn more if we want to about a subject. This video is part of a larger project um, called Towards an Intermedial History of Brazilian Cinema Exploring Intermediality as a Historiographic method. Could you please give us a brief summary of uh, that project and how this video essay fits into the project as a whole? Certainly. So um, the project whose name you just very skillfully got all the way through, I'm going to call it the Intermedia Project, which was the short name we came up for it, um, is both a history of um, Brazilian cinema or a new kind of history of Brazilian cinema, but it's also an attempt to think about how intermediality could be useful for thinking about film history more generally. So it's both an engagement with Brazilian cinema, which of course has a very exciting mix of different art forms feeding into it, everything from music, particularly of course, but carnival to different forms of art project and movement through to theatre and all kinds of different intermedial forms. And, you know, but that's also true to certain, to varying degrees of lots of other cinemas too. So the project was both specifically engaging with Brazilian cinema, but also trying to develop some interesting new ways of thinking about film history and film historiography more generally. The other, the other really exciting thing about it as a project was that it was a collaboration between scholars and researchers um, on both sides of the Atlantic. So my colleague Lucia Najib um, uh, led the project, um, and but we also had a PI or principal investigator at the Federal University of San Carlos uh, in São Paulo State in Brazil, Luciana Araujo. Um, and then we all had three co-eyes or co-investigators in each of those universities, plus some really brilliant postdoctoral researchers on the project. So it was a really wonderful team of people that Lucia had helped put together. We put in an application both to the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and FAPESP, which is the San Paulo State Funding Organisation in Brazil. And they have a sort of joint research scheme and we had put in an application together and um, fortunately we uh, were successful. Um, and it led on to some really exciting and unexpected collaborations and included a number of exciting public outputs, some that we'd planned earlier on, including a season at Tate Modern of Tropicalia Films, uh, which was fantastic, and a season on Brazilian um, documentaries and music documentaries at the Reading Film Theatre. And then we also did other things like restaging some silent movie prologues, which had originally been performed in uh, Rio de Janeiro um, in the 1920s, and restaging those both at Reading in the UK and at the Museum of um, uh, Sound and image in Sao Paulo um, uh, 
with a fantastic theatre company called Compania Antropophagica, who were brilliant to work with as well. So students in Reading, a professional company in, in Brazil. Um, so there were a whole range of different outputs. And as you can tell from some of those examples, they were public engagements which looked at the relationship between film and other arts. And, and we also had more traditional conferences and, and lots of journal articles. But um, uh, audiovisual essays turned out to be a really exciting way of working on the project. And also my colleague Lucia and colleague Samuel, who's from San Carlos, collaborated on a feature documentary about um, particularly new Pernambucan cinema and, and recent San Paolo cinema called Passages, which um, has um, won awards and been very successful in a number of international festivals. So that was another unexpected but very exciting audiovisual output that emerged from the research, or should I say emerged from the scholarship or was scholarship in North American terms. And could you talk a little bit more about your role in the project specifically and what were your, I guess, scholarly interests or research interests uh, going into the to the project and how did it relate to past work uh, that you had done? Good question, Will. So I wasn't particularly knowledgeable about Brazilian cinema when we started, but a number of the other members of the project team were. So it was a really exciting mixture of colleagues with different kinds of skills and experience. Um, and as we were designing the project, we allocated different kinds of roles to different people. Part of my role was to help um, restage the prologues, um, which I did with some brilliant support from um, colleagues Lucy Tyler and Albert L. DK in, in the UK. And we actually integrated it into a, a, third, a final year student module um, and, and charge the students with the task of um, researching and then um, staging these prologues. Um, and we had a wonderful evening where we did that. They took over the whole of the Minghella Studios at Reading and, and um, we had a Brazilian-themed bar and um, then we had these two prologues were performed and then we watched the fragment of one of the films, A Beggar on Horseback, which only a tiny bit remains, and then also a Buster Keaton film, Go West, which the prologues have been written for. So anyway, that was part of what I did. But I was also on the project because... Because of, in terms of thinking about relationships between studio Hollywood cinema and Brazilian film tradition. So I worked with two colleagues, Susana Miranda and Flavia Cesarino Costa, on a couple of video essays that particularly explored those kind of back and forth explorations and drew on some of their insights. And we um, we worked together on some quite interesting projects. So yeah, that was the fun. I was able to bring some audiovisual expertise, which interestingly, my trip to Middlebury came in between us getting the project and the project starting so it was a really good timing from that point of view but I could immediately see here was a I wanted to do my research in this exciting new set of skills I developed etc but also I could see that because an audiovisual essay is itself an intermedial form it gives great potential for exploring some things that you might not be able to explore and express in other ways so that was part of the interest but also yeah interesting dialogues between North American and, and Brazilian cinema was part of what I was supposed to be working on and indeed then enjoyed very much collaborating with colleagues on with Susanna and Flavia in particular. You mentioned just now film prologues, and this is what's discussed, among other things, in the video essay, which I would encourage everyone to please go watch um, at thevideoessay.com. And I think it will be helpful for you, I should have said this earlier, to watch before this conversation. So if you can, maybe hit pause now on the podcast, go watch the video, and then come back. But could you just give us a, what is a film, the, the, these film prologues that you are uh, referring to, just in case someone is listening right now and hasn't yet watched uh, the video essay, and how do they function in the piece? Yeah, good question. So film prologues were uh, an exhibition practice, which um, happened in different parts of the world. It happened in the UK, it happened in the States um, quite extensively. And it happened um, in this brief period in Brazil where a series of high-end marquee cinemas were constructed um, in an area of Brazil, of Rio, which is known as Cinelandia. And one of the ways in which um, the uh, impresarios who created those cinemas was keen to try and um, boost their profile and drive traffic was to create these um, film programs. Um, and one of the fun things about them, I mean, this comes stems from my colleague Luciana Araujo's research into these prologues, and she was able to, to locate the scripts in the National Archive in Rio because they've been kept from the census archive. So we had the scripts and they bring some of those um, typically um, uh, inventive and satirical um, approaches, the sort of carnivalesque approach in many ways, which is a feature of lots of aspects of Brazilian culture. But, you know, it has a their American movie showing in Rio but with a highly specific sometimes um, sacrilegious is the wrong word but you know there's no you know they're, they're quite ready to um, 
poke fun at different kinds of ideas and there's lots of topical local jokes and there are other kinds of things so you would come to the cinema and before you got into the watch the movie you would be able to take in a live prologue it might involve singing it might involve other kinds of performance so there was one um, they used to do for the Phantom of the Opera where they restaged the one of the key scenes with the Phantom and I think when his mask gets taken off and you know and there'd be music and there'd be operatic effects and it'd be spectacular and some of them were satirical and uh, knockabout and engaged in different forms of comedy and they didn't last very long because unlike the kinds of practice that you see in the film Footlight Parade which also appears in the video which were based on the work of other kinds of impresarios in North America like Fanchon and Marco who who realised that if you had something that was a bit less specifically tied to the actual film you'd gone to see you could then recycle it and you could send it out on tour and you could mass produce it just as we see um, James Cagney and co doing in Footlight Parade Um, so it's but yeah so they didn't last very long in Brazil but they were a very interesting example of a number of ways in which in that period there were interesting crossovers between practitioners and practices between cinema and other entertainment forms in um, Brazil at that point in time. So that was what got us excited about them um, in the first place. You can begin to see how this fits into the intermedial history of Brazilian cinema that the project is aiming to document. And, And you begin your essay by saying that it aims to, quote, explore the potential of intermedial methods to offer nonlinear and non-hierarchical approaches to film history. What does this mean? A lot of big words there. Uh, hopefully I just read it all correctly. Um, Good question, Will. So I was, you know, deliberately quoting one of the stated amb- objectives of our project, which we actually wrote into the funding application. Uh, and it's inspired by a number of things which um, aren't especially parts of my heritage or history as a, as a, as a film researcher but are absolutely part of um, some of my collaborators ambitions so on the one hand um, my colleague Lucia Najib has always been you'll probably know her work on world cinema and its ways of rethinking world cinema so one of her commitments has always been to think about world cinema less in terms of Hollywood and other and centre and periphery and more in terms of well particularly different creative waves that, um, that manifested themselves at different places and in, d- in different times, a polysemic approach to film history. So that was one of our motivating factors. And then, of course, there's a tradition in thinking about intermediality, which is connected to certain ideas of the non-linear and perhaps the rhizomatic. There's a connection with some of those forms of post-structuralism. Again, not things I spend a lot of time researching and writing about myself, but I could absolutely see the value of thinking about some of these traditions um, as ways of rethinking film history. And I've certainly always been very interested in challenging the the sort of hierarchies of modernism and popular you know I've always felt part of my interest in Hollywood cinema has always been about its its um its modernist qualities and it and 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 that being a false opposition between sort of high modernism and popular cinema and yeah the great thing about some of those um popular movies is that they're 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 popular entertainments which we would have gone down to our local Odeon or whatever to see but they're also extraordinary complex works of art that might be might be drawing on all kinds of um, modernist frameworks as they work and, and inviting us to engage in that. So that was part of my interest as well as um, interest in certain forms of world cinema. So coming in those, all, all, bringing all those approaches together, I was clearly, you know, this was a, one of our challenges. How do we think about film history in a different way that's not just an evolutionary history and doesn't privilege um, sort of Hollywood versus um, other kinds of cinemas um, in that kind of way? What what other ways might they be able to think that might respond a bit more to patterns of creativity or to back and forth or cultural negotiations of different kinds? So lots of our work was engaged in this kind of uh, approach, but it, it seemed to me that particularly as having engaged with different kinds of parts of the project and listened to some of the things that other colleagues have been working on and engaged in uh, going to see some of the movies we showed at the Tate and some of the different kinds of research that people were going, building up a picture of all these complex intermediate forms. It seemed to me that a video essay would be a really interesting way of exploring some of those links further. So I began to become aware of some of the links that we see mapped out in the in the video. Uh, and then I thought, well, actually, if we're going to do this in the spirit of, a, of an approach which isn't hierarchical and, and is non-linear, then this is a good way to do it. And and and. I, and indeed, I think it it's a much more interesting way of articulating those connections um, videographically than it would be on the page. Again, I like hearing that you Middlebury workshop happened in between you getting this grant and starting the project. So again, in a very organic way that you arrived at the at the video essay as a form in thinking through 
in, in, in just watching your video and reading about the project, it, it seems you've talked a lot about kind of this public scholarship, this public humanities of, of wanting to reach people, I think, beyond the audience of, say, a journal article, which you do in a number of different ways, but that is v- still very much a part of audiovisual criticism. And so this this work is is published, uh, is, is part of this project, of course, but it's also published in movie. It exists on your Vimeo page. And I, 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 I mentioned this as a way to say that is possible and very likely. I mean, your video was included by several people on Sight and Sound's 2019 list of the best video essays. So I imagine people found it through Sight and Sound as well. That many people came to this video without the full context of the project, which has its own webpage and everything else. And so as you were making this video essay, did you think about this and how did it shape the the overall creation of, of making sure that it on one hand fit as part of a project but also could be it's a standalone uh, for the most part piece of research yeah good good question well to take one step back um something we that you've implied there but we haven't really talked about so far this afternoon is that one of the things that also excites me about videographic criticism is its potential to reach a wider audience um and it's also one of the things that i love about style-based criticism i like the fact that it's it's not say that it's easy to read but it's written in it it's not doesn't rely on complex theoretical concepts. It's supposed to be written in a way which anyone can in, appreciate and enjoy. And it's supposed to be grounded in, in an experience of viewing or reviewing the sequence. But I also thought maybe one of the things that I, that I did, that I do um, hope, and clearly is the case in lots of people's work, um, is that you might be able to connect with a much wider audience of film enthusiasts through a video essay or an audiovisual essay than through something that's buried in an j- academic journal somewhere. So you're absolutely right about that as being an impulse. For this particular project, well, I, I hope it works as a standalone piece. I mean, you're right, it, it doesn't, um, it, it goes in with this fairly, um, fairly frank research question, let's put it that way way that, that that people used to following research projects will be more familiar with or used to following some quite complex debates in in film history and film studies will be more ready to appreciate but i i hope it's got something that um is valuable even you know i hope that that's not off-putting and that actually the idea of thinking about how to pursue and explore these connections and to trace those histories that might not be the most obvious or the most traditional ones is something that people enjoy um regardless of whether they've see come to it through the whole project or otherwise it's interesting um i was finishing this one and and teaching a videographic criticism class and and um you know in the spirit of feeding back on everybody's work i showed a bit of my work too and got some useful feedback um, and indeed uh, and was able to incorporate it which was very helpful but um i have i have heard students say mm, this one's really for the other academics isn't it this is less for us as in the audience you know the notorious one yeah i can i'm with you on that one this one seems to be pitched a bit more at the world of film studies than than perhaps undergraduates now i don't know if that's the case but um i I could see what they were getting at there i think it definitely does in in watching it you can see that it is aimed at an audience that is very much aware of these existing discourses in in film history and in world cinema what have you that i'm i am not well versed in those at all but i actually appreciate the way in which the video begins by making that clear and so then i i went into it kind of thinking okay i'm no matter how intently i watch this video i'm not going to walk away with a thorough understanding of the nuances of that discourse so instead i'm gonna focus my attention on trying to take away something else and i think that's i think that's one of the advantages of the video essay as as a form in that you know okay maybe i'm not at I'm not in that scholarly world or whatever that perhaps the essay is derived from, but I'm still going to take something away from it and learn something. And I didn't really know anything about these movie prologues. So I think just that is a is a win. If you if you walk away from this video knowing about that and something about Brazilian cinema and you think, hey, maybe maybe I should go check this out. That that seems worth it to me. Um, yeah. And there's some fascinating material, isn't there? So the, the images from Fanch, the Fanch and Marco archive, if you, you know, they're they're really exciting to see and there are some you know there's some exciting popular forms of cinema and other kinds of history bound up in in the experience of the video so hopefully yeah that some of those things haven't lost their power i'm sure even after i've finished with them (laughs) one of the things i most appreciated about the video is that it at times felt to me like a collage and i love videos that where i feel the video essayist is just trying to pull in any material they can to help make the argument. And I felt that in 
your piece because well it begins with this handwritten mind map that you you take us around throughout the video which i love and then you draw on film clips uh still photographs archival footage from the the live performances that you put on so there's all these different types of things in 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 watching i was very aware that i was watching a video essay and, and not in a in, in a bad way, but in, in, a, in a way that made me really reflect on all the, the relationship between all these different types of media, which I think is one of the goals of the project. So um, I imagine that was your intent. And could you just talk a little bit about the, I guess, the implications of presenting audiovisual criticism in this way? Because I think sometimes audiovisual critics, often we try to mask our own production and have this immersive quality and make sure everything's kind of flows in this very precise way, almost like we're making a little film in our in and of ourselves. And and your video does not do that. And in fact, really embraces that and uses it to its advantage. Yeah, thanks, Bill. That's lovely to hear. So yes, it was absolutely an intention to use as many uh, different media as I could in the form of the video. And that's obviously in the spirit of examining these different media, but also deliberately deploying different approaches in the form of the video. So that was certainly part of my intent and, and indeed helps you to make some of these nonlinear connections as you move from one practice or media form or art form to another. It was also the case that I was very keen to bring out the research journey, as it were, or bring out some of the process. So that mind map or concept map is is exactly the map that I was, you know, page of a, a journal that I was working away on and making those links and that's the, the real thing. Um, and I and also I wanted to bring some of the sort of journey of finding out things and make that part of the spectator's experience of the video essay as, as well, if you see what I mean. So I wanted it to have a self-reflexive quality in that respect and, and to draw attention to some of the limits and some of the successes of the process of research or the process of creating scholarship. So that was absolutely um, part of my hope as well. What was the final part of your question there, Will? Oh, yeah. It was about whether we make a hermetically sealed kind of approach, whether we, whether as audiovisual essayists we're trying too hard to create something that's really smooth and moves us very dynamically through the material. Um, you know, I was very happy to have a more open form in that sense. Um, but let's not forget that um, moving self, being self-reflexive and, well, A, there are lots of very interesting practices in um, contemporary videographic criticism, which are precisely about being self-reflexive and drawing attention to the means and the process. Process. And if you think of some of the traditions of desktop documentary or you think of Kevin B. Lee's work where he takes the timeline of the editing program and uses that as an analytical tool, um, that's, you know, that's that's as much videographic criticism, I think, as, as, as creating a really effective cut or dissolve that makes your point. That's just as much deploying videographic and audiovisual means to make your point. So I think there's absolutely that tradition. But then also being self-reflexive and... You know, involvement and distance are not mutually exclusive. And I think that maybe that's true about how we work as audiovisual essayists too. We might say that of a of an Ophel's film or a Brechtian performance, but it's also the case, you know, not claiming my works in that category, but you know, you can move between different kinds of address in interesting ways and, and actually being aware of your own process and, and the form in which you're working I think makes a lot of sense for a video essayist. A video essayist. I, I think the I hadn't thought about the connection you make between the desktop documentary and what you do, but I think you're absolutely right. I think what I felt while watching your video essay was, and obviously you use the mind map to bring us there, so this isn't a shock that, that I felt this way, but I really felt like the video was you just recreating your your thinking process. Like I really felt like we were inside your head there. And so I think that would be the, I get some of that when I'm on the desktop documentary, but because you don't show us like the, the, the interface of your computer or whatever, it's like we're in this kind of void. And I was like, uh, we're like in John's mind, <laughs> kind of, this is, uh, is, is how I felt. There are times when you use voiceover so we hear you explain what's going on. Sometimes you use text on screen. And I was wondering how you chose to use one versus the other. When did you decide to use both? Because I think I have my hunch on why you used one over the other in certain instances, but I'd be curious to hear why you chose to use voiceover when you did and text on screen when you did. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so yeah, and yeah, don't forget 
Chloe Galibert Lenay's work as well here, well, because of course the process of viewing is very much and process of engaging is very much part of the subject of, of her work. And of course, she's been one of your uh, people you've spoken to on the podcast before. Um, but going back to your question about voiceover and on screen caption, well, it was partly again in the spirit of using as many different um, forms as possible in, 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 or, you know, in, in the interest of being intermedial. But it was also, I think, about which works best for different kinds of part of the process. So the advantage of listening to a voiceover is that you can um, you can listen and watch and listen to other things at the same time. You know, it's easier to sometimes to take it, it shapes your engagement with material in different ways to reading an on-screen caption, doesn't it? And equally, an on-screen caption might enable you to listen to to a piece of music or a, watch a dance at the same time, or it might be less less disruptive or less intrusive in some kinds of material you want to look at and others. So it was partly a choice about what makes sense. If I've got the karaoke dance from flying down to Rio playing and I want people to watch Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers or I want them to watch um, Etta Moten and listen to her, then then perhaps it's much better to have the on-screen caption. I also want to respond to the rhythms of how that number is playing out and its different dimensions. And having the written on-screen caption seems to me to be the best way of engaging with that without being too obtrusive. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm looking at a series of photographs from the archive or guiding us through a different kind of transition, then sometimes it might be better to, to use a voiceover. And I think perhaps having both makes draws your attention to the fact that there are both and, and might make you think a bit more about when it's a voiceover and when it's an on-screen caption. Now let's transition to talking about the two video essays that you uh, selected for us to, to talk about. Two brilliant works that we are not even going to be able to really scratch the surface on uh, in this conversation, but it's my hope that we can provide a, sort of an introduction to these two videos and then listeners will go and watch them and engage with them on their own. They are videos by Patrick Keating and Liz Green, and Liz is a former guest on this show. Uh, we'll have to have Patrick on at some point, of course. He's making some of the, the best work out there right now in the field. But please, John, you, because you selected these, we'll, we'll turn them over to you and ask you to just provide a, a brief introduction and perhaps an explanation for why you found these two videos uh, so compelling and wanted to, to talk about them today. So the, so the first one is called The Strange Streets of a Strange City, The Ambersons Montage by Patrick Keating. And the other one is called The Elephant Man Sound, Tracked. Uh, and they've both been published by Nexus, which we ought to mention too as being another place where some very innovative uh, videographic work has been published in recent years. Um, and what brings them both together, I think, is that they uh, are both bring together... Well, Patrick's one is a very interesting example of a close analysis, which also draws on um, a range of different kinds of ways of thinking about the history of the production. So production history and how that helps us to further understand how the finished film ended up. And Liz's one is a very fascinating process of dramatising or um, animating the archive. So she, as you mentioned earlier on in our talk, she takes one tiny element of the soundtrack, in fact, an element of the soundtrack which has been removed, and from that she builds a really interesting history which tells us quite a bit about The Elephant Man. It tells us about Anne Splett and his working relationship with David Lynch. It tells us about different kinds of production practices, and it takes us to... Uh, uh, an understanding of, of the development of um, modern methods of um, production design, the Bay Area workflow, and and the and the emergence of sound design as a concept in recent American cinema or in, or in New Hollywood. So she able to take us on a really wonderful journey from some very particular details, and it includes all kinds of. I mean, talk about intermediate approaches, but it includes interviews, it includes analysis of. Um, production, um, you know, of Screen International and other kinds of production newspaper. It takes us um, into different kinds of engagement with different artefacts and we get into Liz's computer and, and listen to different parts of the soundtrack and she's able to animate these details, perhaps to help us to hear and to see the details more clearly than we would do otherwise. So it's extremely inventive and imaginative way of both pushing at the form of the videographic essay, but also of uh, the audiovisual essay, but also so of um, thinking about how you can make an archive material come alive. And, and she's been working on it for a number of years, I know, and 
it's a really um, exciting piece of work. Turning back to Patrick's piece, um, so again, as we were saying earlier, he takes a, a passage of the film, which is the sort of thing that you might just brush over or, you know, not fully recognise, might have interest. And he finds some typically videographic ways of exploring it. He he draws on the original book by Booth Tarkington. He draws on the script. He drew, draws on some archival notes of the long lost, the tragically lost original cut of Ambersons and and but then he uses the film as it exists to help dramatize those bits of history but he also is always finding genuinely um, videographic ways of articulating what's at stake so he does some very interesting things with you know he he dramatizes some of the forms he's talking about uh, in intriguing ways so one of the things he's interested in is the perspectival lines of this sequence as opposed to the very different compositions we get in other parts of the movie throughout he's he's seeding some of those ideas so that when he includes a number of quotes from the um the ill-fated um audience preview screenings of ambersons they take up the kinds of perspectives that the, the, the perspective of all lines of the scene which he's going to talk about later in the essay uh, it, it, they're already mapped onto that kind of grid in interesting ways and he also you know just small but effective things he 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 dramatizes how much of ambersons is left in the version that got released and that we can see today versus the original cut that were uh, we was working towards or uh, you know had achieved uh, you know there are different ways in which those kinds of things are just expressed so deftly uh, videographically but he's also able to reuse the materials including Wells's voiceover or the shot of the microphone or some of those elements he's able to bring it to life in a very exciting way and, and you can you come away from it thinking goodness I want to go back and see that film again because he's he's just given you a whole set of new ways of thinking about it and and evoking some of its key moments one thing that Patrick and Liz both share is that they both have production backgrounds, which you can absolutely feel in the piece. And they have a deep knowledge of how a film is produced. In the case of Patrick, you have this deep sense of cinematography, of those angles that you reference. And in Liz's, you have this sense of what it's like to be the sound designer on a film set. Yeah, that's a very, very nicely observed point, Will. And that's absolutely true. I think the other thing that's in play here is it's not just the fact that um, they have the professional expertise in these two different areas, sound and cinematography. But also these projects are coming out of their wider research over a number of years. So Liz's research into the Sound Mountain Archive um, takes on a new form here, doesn't it? And Patrick's work often draws on his, as you rightly say, his his skill and knowledge of cinematography, but also on wider kinds of archiving and processes that, that he's been engaged with. So some of his other video essays are able to pluck all of these different examples of tracking shots or crossing the street shots or whatever it might be, because he's been collecting those things for some time. So they're both, and, and obviously Liz has been working on these questions of the sound archive and tra- recording tape the opportunity to record different interviews with different people involved in that story at different times but it it shows the hinterland of their wider research as well as showing their professional practice that might have informed that original research and their interest in that original research These, these are two people who are teachers right these are two people who are explaining these concepts to students over and over again and that is really helpful in this piece. They, they strike a really great balance, which I think is sometimes hard to do in videographic criticism, which is how do I explain enough to provide a baseline of knowledge that ev- that allows everyone to come to the video without over explaining. And, and I, th- I think both do a really great job. And I'm actually reminded of how, of how we begin to, began our conversation talking about the program at Reading, which has this emphasis in the, the, the creative and, and the more critical side. And it seems that these videos for me are proof that even if you don't want to be a filmmaker, you will take away something from you know really studying film production and taking a production course in your, your critical work. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. And I think it also reminds us that it it can all come in handy later on you know it all comes around later on a bit like when you're when you're working on a I often say to research students when they've written something and it doesn't make it into the final thesis don't worry it will come around later on you'll find it will inform something different and and that's clearly true about these more extensive and wider professional and life experiences they can come in handy and they shape our individual approaches to this exciting new film I think 
And in, in, in Liz's video in, in particular, we really get the sense that this is a byproduct of years of research, just in the fact that, you know, I see the, the interview with David Lynch and Liz provides the date on screen, which I think was either 2006 or 2007. And you think, wow, like that has just been, you know, I, I'm sure Liz has used it in other ways, but you know, that file, who who knows when it's going to become, come in handy. And so in, in a sense that the videographic critic, and I'm sure this is true for the written critic as well, but it, it just shows, as, as you've said, that this importance of making sure that you maintain one's own archive, let alone looking at the archives of others. Um, and I think in that way, it, these really do a great job of blending not only a film production with film analysis, but also with this personal, their personal relationships to these films. Um, and they do that also through their brilliant voiceovers, which are both just superb. And you're right. I mean, Liz is, is a very interesting example because when both, well, Patrick, Liz and I were all part of that first cohort at Middlebury. And I know Liz was already setting herself the challenge of how do I work with an archive videographically or audio visually? We'd probably better say in this case, what are the forms in which I can dramatise um, this kind of history and this, these kinds of interests? And, and one of the things that's so exciting about the essay is that it does precisely that. And it captures all these complex forms of history. And it takes you all the way from Johnny Carson at the Oscars through to, and you know, original on set recordings and and but yeah finding finding audio visual and the visual is as important as the audio here ways of helping us to engage with that and the process but also its significance in in wider terms so it's a it's a really successful project from that point of view when, when you and I were emailing back and forth and I asked you, what videos do you want to talk about and why? You said that you were intrigued by these videos because they engage with production history videographically. Why does that excite you? Yeah, that's that's good. Well, and we began by talking ab ab about style-based criticism and and how that works it well videographically. But we also talked about the relationship between practice and critical, historical, in this case, archival thinking. And one of the things that's interesting for me is how those things come together. So I've done a bit of work of this myself. That process of extending the methods and subjects of style-based criticism included for me following a film through its production and, uh, and, and trying to identify some of the key decisions from an artistic point of view, from an endpoint point of view, from an audience's point of view, and then trying to trace the history of how those choices came to be made through that complex mixture of interaction between different creative personnel, between the, the relationship between your plans and circumstances that arrive, the process of how you have to re, you know, you set out with a fine set of intentions and you need to have those intentions very clearly expressed, but it's only that that enables you to improvise or respond collaboratively, creatively on set, and then how you might have to revise your plans again in post-production. I think bringing those things together is really important both in terms of a, a better sense of, of how films come to be but it's also very interesting as we're agreeing for, for students of film for aspiring filmmakers but also for aspiring critics and thinking of that back and forth how you move between the choices made and the meaning of those choices and how those choices came to be made and what's at stake in making those choices and what the consequences of those choices are I think that's that access is where it's all at and, and these two essays are both really good examples of, of that process. One video I said that was very rightly praised in this year's most recent sight, sight and sound poll was Katie Bird's on the steady on uh, the, the steady cam, um, and I think of uh, of Patrick's work in his video essay on Marlena Dietrich lighting, and he has this great new video essay published in movie on sound and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and then we have cinematography, and here we have Liz talking about sound design and actually showing the work of of the sound designer. I'm sorry, I'm I'm blanking on the sound designer's name, which is a bad time for and me. Split. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. And as I'm making this point, which is that it, it's exciting to see that videographic criticism in the way that it can reach a wider audience can also be a way to acknowledge all this other labor that goes into making a film beyond the the director or the formers. Uh, it's very exciting. No, exactly. And and there's 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 no contradiction, I think, between thinking about style based criticism and thinking about all the creative personnel who are involved in that journey and, and getting there. And and you're right. These projects are also ones that that are interested in exploring and dramatizing those complex relationships. And they're very difficult to, to capture in a way, aren't they? Particularly as production is something that happens. All we've got in a way on the whole is the product of that production and that collaboration. But yes, um, going back to some of our earlier debates, um, you can think about out. You can think about film style. You can even th you can think about director centred criticism. In t while also relishing, em enjoying, appreciating the collaboration, the different skills, and the different processes that go towards creating the works that we're admiring here. 
in fact it's essential to have an appreciation of that and that's what some of this work is doing is to try and be more precise about those kinds of collaborations and that's been our theme collaboration between your project we're working with doug pie your students everything so i think that's a a great way to uh to end our conversation so thank you so much john for for joining us uh on the video essay podcast after a year of uh, a year of quarantine it's it's great that we could finally uh, connect thank you will it's been a great pleasure and a, a very interesting and provoking conversation thank you and now i am very pleased to be joined here uh by Doug Pye, Douglas Pye, uh, who is a scholar with the University of Reading, uh, who is the series editor with John Gibbs of Close Up at Wallflower Press, is an editorial board member of the online journal Movie, a journal of film criticism, and is the joint series editor of Palgrave Close Readings in Film and Television, and is the co-author, author author of a number of audiovisual essays, um, including in collaboration with John Gibbs, who you've already heard from on this episode of the Video Essay Podcast, author of books and articles, whose latest work is V.F. Perkins on Movies, Collected Shorter Film Criticism. Doug, thank you so much for joining us on the Video Essay Podcast today. It's so great to have you. Well, it's a great pleasure. I was delighted to be invited. Thanks. And before I I ask you my the, the questions that I've prepared to today, I just wanted to give you and the listeners a sense of of why I've invited you to come on this podcast today. Because while we could talk about the video essays that you've made in collaboration with John Gibbs, um, one of my goals for this podcast, as we've now, it's been around for about a year and a half, one of my new goals is to try and introduce listeners to works, whether they be books, films, videos, and people who who are doing work that maybe are not directly related to audiovisual criticism, videographic criticism, but that I personally, and I would assume many others think, would greatly contribute um, to the conversations that are going on in the audiovisual criticism community. And that I think if you are out there producing video essays, this is work that perhaps you should should vi- should visit for the first time or perhaps revisit. Of course, the work of Victor Perkins is familiar to, to many folks out there. Um, but I, it's my hope that this podcast will perhaps reach someone who is not familiar with his work um, will then encourage you to go to go seek it out and then take that work and perhaps incorporate it into your audiovisual criticism, whether directly or indirectly. Now, for me personally, I... Uh, had the good fortune of encountering Victor's work for the first time at Middlebury College. Um, And this was just on the heels of taking a videographic criticism course for the first time. And and it was in taking that course taught by Jason Mattel that I really got to feel excited about film studies for the first time. And the following semester, I read Film as Film uh, in a course taught by Ledger Grindon on methods of film criticism. And then in later course on film theory, re-encountered Victor's work again in a course taught by Christian Keithley. And so for me, discovering Victor's work has run right alongside my discovery of audiovisual criticism. Um, so for me, the two are very much one and the same. And so Doug, after uh, giving you my autobiography there, um, could you please tell us a little bit more about you and your work? Um, and if you would give us an introduction to who Victor Perkins is uh, for someone who, who may not be familiar with him and his work. Well, let me do that first. Um, just talk a little bit about Victor. I mean, he was British, of course, um, born in 1936 and died um, in 2016. And um, he was, I mean, you know, one level, I can start by the way, in the way that I started with the introduction of the book, you know, he is one of the most brilliant of English language film critics. Um, you mentioned film as film and um, film as film is, is internationally known, you know, in almost anybody within, uh, you know, has a serious interest in the study of film will have come across film as film. But you'll also know that, of course, film studies has gone through a whole variety of, 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 of changes um, and uh, transformations and, and massive debates and so on in the last um, 40 years, really, of 40, 50 years of its existence. And um, Victor's work was certainly one of the uh, areas that tended to suffer with the great wave of theory uh, that came, that was associated initially with uh, the British Journal screen, but was then disseminated very widely within the emerging film departments, really across the English-speaking world. And you know that was part, really, in a way of the of the retreat from criticism, from the the, the retreat from evaluation. And 
Criticism and evaluation are absolutely central to Victor's work. So there's film as film, but film as film was um, the culmination, and was published in 1972, was the culmination of what was really the first phase of Victor's career. I mean, he began um, writing about film um, late 50s, early 60s, when he was a student at Oxford. And then in, the, in 1962, with a number of colleagues, he established um, the journal Movie, which became um, a centre of considerable debate, um, you know, during the 60s. Um, and it was distinguished really for, for, I suppose, for two things. I mean, one was it attacked prevailing attitudes to film, to cinema, uh, and prevailing kind of conventions of taste and and evaluation and value, particularly in Britain. And it argued for a detailed systematic criticism of movies, which doesn't sound remotely controversial. But, you know, it was not something that actually was widely practiced. I mean, partly, of course, because studying movies in detail was extraordinarily difficult. At that time, you could only see them in theatres. You could only see movies in theatres. You know, I mean, television was showing movies, but, you know, predominantly, if you wanted to see a movie, you went out to the cinema. If you wanted to see it more than once, you chased it around the cinemas as it moved around the distribution circuits. And that's exactly what Victor and his colleagues did in London in the early 60s. They chased these Hollywood movies because the other thing that they, well, that they became famous for was pioneering a, a serious and sustained critical um, approach to Hollywood movies and to a range of directors in, in particular. Um, so he was publishing during this period a, a significant amount of, of, of work in, in movie and then later on published also in a range of other small journals and smaller journals. So there's a bod- there was a body of work outside film as film, very closely related to it because Victor was extremely... Um, I mean, his values really didn't change. His work, I suppose one might say, deepened, became more sophisticated in some ways. But actually, you know, the, it remained fundamentally very, very similar um, in, its, in its approaches. But there was a great body of work, a, a lot of which was very, be- had become very difficult to access. Because uh, in the US, for instance, you know, there are relatively few universities that have, for instance, a full run of movie. And so... Uh, I mean, this actually, before Victor died, I tried to um, to prevail on him to make a collection of his articles. And Wayne State, who the University Press that, that published the book, um, were at that time very interested. Barry Grant, who edits their film series, was very enthusiastic. And Victor was very cautious about it. He wanted, he said, yeah, I'd be interested, but he, 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 he would do something which was half old stuff and half new stuff. Now, Victor was a very slow writer, uh, so I wasn't <laughs> at all confident that the, the new stuff would appear on any short time scale. And then, of course, he got ill and he died. And then what happened was that um, Victor's daughter, Polly, brought together a group of Victor's friends and colleagues to think about his legacy. And one of the things that we immediately said we wanted to do was to, to put a collection together. And I told them the story about Victor and Wayne State and that I had the contacts with Wayne State. And it sort of it went from there. When I, I went back to Barry and, and, and Wayne State and they're extremely enthusiastic about it. And we collected all the stuff, you know, and some of which was pretty fugitive and uh, <laughs> it had to, be, had to be scanned. You know, I mean, it was... It, it, it was quite a kind of physical effort in the early stages to get all that stuff digitized. But so that's how the book came about. So what we hope is that, you know, the bait that, that Victor's, Victor already had a very significant reputation based substantially on film as film. And also the two monographs that he wrote for BFI Classics, which are also wonderful, that the Victor's the reputation will kind of grow, his influence will be extended. And we know that out there among academics now, younger academics particularly, there is um, a growing interest in detailed criticism and the kind of criticism that looks intently at style, film style. So, you know, the book is out there now. We, I also think, as you do, 
that it has a very interesting relationship to the practices of or kind of relevance for the practices of audiovisual criticism. Mm -hmm. But we'll come on to that, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thank you for that wonderful summary of his life in this book. And, and I'm holding it up right now and no one can no one can see it. But I'll, of course, link to uh, Wayne State University Press on our website, thevideoessay.com. And I have to say, I haven't finished the whole volume, but uh, because I'm having such a good time going through it, it's really beautifully done and has a wonderful blurb from so many folks, including a um, friend of this show, Adrian Martin, who was on the show many months ago. Um, and so I would definitely recommend people go and check it out. And I have to say, when I was going on and ordering it, they had such a wonderful library of film books. I I was I had to really exercise some self control to just not order order you know the collected works of Robin Wood and all these other things. So it was really great. Maybe they have some type of shipping discount. You can get a bunch of books in bulk order. But anyway, I, I want to ask you a, a follow up question, and this is a question that I asked John Gibbs. So it'll be interesting to see how your uh, answers are similar and different. Could you elaborate a little more on what detailed criticism is, and specifically, could you offer us a definition of film style? Because I think these are terms that, on the surface, may seem a little kind of simple and easy to understand. But as you know, this, as you just said, this book is really dedicated to kind of an advocacy. <clears throat> excuse me, an advocacy of exploring film style in more detail and in the form of detailed criticism. So could you just elaborate a little more on, on what those are and how they might differ from other forms of film analysis that we might encounter? Yes. I mean, um, you know, not, neither of them are kind of uncomplicated terms in a way because, you know, <clears throat> a detailed criticism could involve approaching a whole variety of different dimensions of movies in detail. What it tended to mean, what it tends to mean for us and it meant for Victor was looking very intently at the choices, the decisions that the director in particular had made in, let us say, staging the film. You know, and actually, those material decisions that go into uh, the the um, the images that we see and the sounds that we hear. Now, that's not to say, of course, that other people are not involved. I mean, we know that movies require enormous numbers of people, a good many of whom have crucial creative roles. But um, what Victor saw and what, you know, he, he made directors the centre of his criticism, not in terms of authorship, he was, he was quite, quite sceptical, as you know, if you've read at least one of the later pieces uh, about um, the notion of authorship, the concept of authorship. But director-centred, he made the director the centre because the director was the figure who held everything together, who took an overview, as it were, and who is responsible primarily for the staging, for the way in which those images are put together. So what detailed criticism involves, really, is looking very intently at the material um, texture of the movie, the decisions out of which we get that synthesis of you know, light, sound, performance, color, costume, setting, did I, you know, all, all the elements of film. And the reason for that is because that's actually what films are. You know, they are a mass of decisions in a whole range of the, the, the different kinds of decisions that are brought together and that produce the experience that we have when we look at and we listen to a uh, uh, to, to a movie. Now, so, so it wasn't that, that Victor was against talking about, talk, talking about the wider structures of movies, nor are we. You know, I mean, you know, you, you, one needs to talk about story, one needs to talk about performances, about casting, about the wider structures. And those can be discussed um, broadly, or they can be discussed again in detail. But the centre of detailed criticism, I think, always for Victor was, was taking you back into what these days we think of as the text, you know, that. Taking you back and describing, I mean, description becomes a very important part of this. We may want to talk more about that. But, you know, describing what it is that you actually, that makes up that experience that you have as you watch the film. Mm -hmm. So at one level, you're kind of unpicking the decisions. But at the same time, as you're doing that, of course, what, what, what your aim is, is a critical understanding. So you're also trying to um, look at the ways in which the, these relate to each other, to understand the significance that they have in relation to each other and so on. And ultimately, um, 
I mean, people vary in the emphasis they put on interpretation, but, but, but ultimately there, there is an act of interpretation also going on. So that, I mean, that for, for, for me, and I take it for Victor too, is detailed criticism. And what people will see if they look at the book, as they do with, if you look at film as film, is that Victor will frequently take you right down into the details of, so in, in film as film, it might be the psycho Schaubach murder, that absolutely extraordinary analysis of the psycho Schaubach murder. In the book, there's a whole series of different movies that he just he takes you into a moment in the film, takes you through it in, in great detail and, and gradually argues the relationship of what he's describing, what he's talking about, to the wider structures of the film that the filmmakers have set in place. Now, film style, I mean, at one level, I think, you know, film style is simply, as it were, the sum of all the decisions that have taken place. But that in itself isn't enough. I mean, it's, it's the regularities, as it were, that are created through that synthesis of all the decisions. So, I mean, you know, a stylistic decision could be a decision as to what colour shirt I'm going to wear in the scene. It could be to do, it would be to do with the lighting and so on. So these are the, these are very, you know, a single but potentially significant decisions. But talking about style on a, on a, on a broad, in a broader way, is to talk about the regularities, the patterns, Systems is a bit too mechanistic, but people often talk about the systems of style, but is a bit mechanistic. But, you know, it points in the right direction, as it were. So one's interested in the decisions, but in the patterning of those decisions as well. So that's, I mean, I think for us, film style, it would involve, for instance, you let's say, you know, a film that, that uses it long takes extensively or is heavily based in montage you know one can talk about those broad tendencies but again for detailed criticism you want to root those broad tendencies into the specifics of the moments the eloquence of those moments in which these things come together to create effect does that make some sort of sense it really does. And the reason I've, and thank you again for, for, for describing those terms. The reason I asked you to kind of shed some light on those two terms is because the way you've just spoken, I think really recalls the language that we use on this podcast and that others use to talk about videographic criticism in the sense that you say that Victor and in the kind of work that you and John Gibbs have done is returning to the text what we would call the text, which is the film or the television show or whatever. With videographic criticism, you are quite literally making your argument with the text. So it is inherently the ultimate return to text. But then as you say, you need to, once you return to the text, you need to advance some form of argument analysis. It seems to me you're nodding your head that you agree with me. And you've already said as much that that's analogous to what we do with videographic criticism. I'm wondering if you could shed some light on what you see are the relationships between the two beyond, I guess, the obvious things that we've just mentioned. But how, how do you view the form as, is it a continuation of the type of work that we see Victor trying to advance here? Is it like a, a branch of it? How, how do you see it playing out? Well, I mean, I, um, that's actually quite a difficult question. I mean, I tend, you, you said videographic criticism, and that's, although, you know, we all use video for short, as it were, you know, as you do for the podcast, you know, and video essay. The term I favor is videographic, videographic criticism, you know, so videographic, you know, obvious reasons, but criticism. And, you know, Victor saw himself very emphatically as a film critic. You know, hated the term film studies, by the way. You know, just, um, you know too much studies and not enough film was the kind of... <laughs> uh, um, I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. No, it's not original. That, that, that I seem to remember was Victor. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, so videographic criticism. Now, I am not remotely... Um, an expert, as so many of your contributors are in, in the videographic world. You know, I watch some, but I'm by no means up with, the, you know, even some of the major figures. So, 
some of them are familiar to me, many not. And I've been involved only, you know, in the production of videographic criticism only in, well, it's three, but two, two of them are part one and part two. So three works that John and I made together. But, okay, I mean, the great, the great thing about videographic criticism is that well, the medium of video, if you like, the great thing about it is that it can do what print, what criticism in print simply cannot do, which is to quote movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so when you're writing about movies, you have to take the reader through, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, to, to analyze a scene, you have to take the reader into and through the scene in language. You can't show them the scene. You can put stills up maybe, but you know, with videographic criticism, that's exactly what you can do. But in being able to show, being able to show obviously isn't, isn't enough. You also have to show what's, what you find significant in what happens. And that would potentially take us into the whole area of the relationship between what you see, the, 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 the sound and the image that comes from the movie and voiceover or any narration that the, the thing has. Because I'm, I'm, I do have considerable difficulties with the idea that criticism can do without language. But, you know, that is a whole debate and I know it takes place in a big way, you know, within um, the videographic world. With the disclaimer that it is an incredibly nuanced debate that we cannot cover in this podcast, could you just give us a, a, a brief summary of why you feel that way? Because I, I, I think you're, you're not alone in that way. And I think that is, and people who disagree with you who are in, in videographic criticism, like that is in such a part of how they are trying to argue the opposite point to try to advance the form forward. And so I think it's a very interesting uh, debate. And I don't think we've had anyone on the show before um, kind of elaborate on that, th elaborate that view. I'm not sure how much I can elaborate. It, it is, and it, you know, I mean, it, it, it may be very much to do with the fact that I'm not all that well versed in the videographic world and, and so on. But it seems to me, you know, if, if, um, if one's talking about videographic criticism, as opposed to any other thing that you might think that videographic work can do. But it does, does seem to me that you're involved in argument. You know, you made the point earlier on. I mean, um, an argument, you can develop to some extent, it seems to me, an argument via images and, you know, um, and, and the sound from movies alone. I've seen some work, I couldn't name it, but, you know, that, that clearly attempts to do that. But I think ultimately, argument without language is extraordinarily difficult. I mean, I know, you know, language itself, of course, has phenomenal difficulties with movies, you know. I mean, and that's partly what makes, video, what makes Victor's work so extraordinary, that, that Victor's work at its best, and it's at its best a great deal of the time, is adequate in a way that very few writers work is to the movies that he talks about you know i mean it's um he finds ways through language of um describing evoking and analyzing in ways that you just will feel to many to most probably viewers true to the film that's not true of an awful lot of work that we see but anyway language so how do you conduct an argument completely divorced from language. Great thing about videographic criticism at one level is simply that it can, it, it can make certain kinds of certain uses of language that you, you need for, for written criticism, for print criticism, redundant. You know, you don't have to do levels of description that you might have to do. On the other hand, you know, I'm thinking about some stuff that I've written, but also stuff that Victor's written. You show a sequence, for instance. Um, I mean, John and I show the opening sequence of Notorious, and um, well, I think we show it two or three times. We keep coming back to it. But we show it, and then we make some points about it. You know, it's you point out things about it. Now, we haven't had to describe it in elaborate detail through language, 
but you do have to then say, okay, what do you know? What do you find significant about this? The way in which the camera moves, the nature of what we see, why all the blokes are wearing hats. <laughs> and those things don't necessarily leap out and draw attention to themselves, although they're there. You know, we all we all see the same movie, but we don't all take note of the same things. And indeed, it's incredibly difficult to take note of huge masses of the material that the movie, you know, constantly presenting you with. So, I mean, it's simply that at one level, you know, how, how do you do that kind of thing without language? How do you conduct an argument without language? So it's, it's a sort of, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skeptic of non-language <laughs> based criticism. Mm -hmm. I don't say it doesn't exist, but I'm not convinced that I've seen it yet. I've seen a lot of work that is very evocative in the, the juxtapositions that it makes and the, you know, the wonderful ways in which you can kind of overlap images and, the, I mean, extraordinary um, things that you can do. Very evocative, very um, thought-provoking. Whether I would consider them arguments, critical arguments, I'm... Um, 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 well, perhaps I'll just say I'm not sure. No, I understand the point you're making. And to be clear, I, I by saying that it's not criticism or not an argument, you're not demeaning the work. You're just saying that it's it's something different. And I think and I think we we encounter that a lot in this kind of work where we, we see videos and we say oh, that well that isn't quite videographic criticism for whatever reason, different reasons than what you've just described and outlined. And that's not to say that you haven't made a compelling, interesting, engaging video. And I guess, you know, for me, I think the question now is this point of language, I think is, is a good one. I think the videographic critic must address those concerns that you've just laid out because they're obviously very legitimate ones. And the question is, okay, how can editing, how can uh, zooming in on the image, how can distortion, how can that advance an argument in a way that language can or it cannot or is different. And I think that's the challenge of the videographic critic. And what I'm interested in, and I think that does advance an argument, but I'm inter increasingly interested in what it means to write about videographic criticism. Because as you say, there are some pieces of what we would call video essays that require interpretation from another critic. That's right. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're different. They, you know, they're, they're, they're thought provoking and all that. But, you know, the, the, I mean, what you say about um, interpreting, you know, a, 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 a work of criticism. I mean, in a sense, again, it's 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 not the same as in language, but of course, that's true too of written criticism. Of you course, know, yes. No, no, no critical form is um, you know is complete in itself. It has to be read, it has to be understood, it has to be interpreted. What is significant for particular readers has to be singled out, you know, and will then be mediated and remediated, and so on. I'm not sure where that where where exactly that's <laughs> taking me, but I that that but but I think it is a different process. If, I, th I think if if I'm if I write about Victor, say, or write about Robin Wood, or you know, actually take take part of their argument to pieces for for whatever reason, then um, we're both using language. When I'm not that I've done it, but you know, when when you're you you for instance may be doing it about a piece of videographic work, there seems to be a kind of level of what in, interpretation necessary, bef, you know, which wouldn't be necessary for the 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 work that is based on you know, the written work that's based on writing. I mean, I mean, I'm you know, I'm, I think these. <laughs> These are things that I really haven't thought about much and um, probably shouldn't right. you know, take, take up any more of your time with just speculating about them because I'm really quite um, ignorant. Yeah, well, I think when you're... I know, but I, I think you're, you're raising something that I haven't really thought of before, which is you're absolutely right. But when I watch a piece of videographic criticism that is perhaps more loose in form and is not you know, perhaps essayistic at first glance, you know, I'm immediately looking at the formal choices that the videographic critic has made. Whereas when I read Victor or, or when I'm reading Robin Wood or you or whoever, I, I mean, maybe I'm noticing their syntax and grammar. Maybe I'm noticing where they put a comma or, or something like that, but I'm much more focused on kind of what they are what they are saying through the language, not as much how they are saying it. I mean, maybe I, in some cases I would be, but it's definitely not the first thing that I'm, that I'm thinking of. 
which seems kind of obvious, but I hadn't really thought of it in that way before until you just said that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's true. That, you know, we up to a certain point, for most purposes, language becomes transparent to us. Right. We're, we're, we're trying to extract the thought. As we get, you know, I mean, actually, as you begin to to read um, in more detail, someone like Victor or Robin would really, um, just to name somebody else that you've named, um, what you become increasingly aware of, and this is not unlike watching a movie more than once, is that actually the material, the, the, the material out of which the thought is forged, which is language, and the way in which that language is used is, of course, crucial. I mean, it's one of, I think you quote, um, or you quoted to me in your notes, a little quotation that I use from Deborah Thomas, Yes, I'll read it for the listeners now. Please do, yeah. Deborah Thomas writes on page 14 of in Doug's uh, introduction to the book, in Victor's writing, language mirrored its object so aptly that it is scarcely possible to paraphrase him without losing the delicate intelligence of his insights, as well as his affinity with the seemingly ineffable filmic moments he somehow caught texture and all in the words he wove. I, mean, I think that, and I think that's absolutely, well, why I quoted it, you know, I mean, just, that's absolutely right. And it's very much what I meant by saying that, you know, Victor's work is adequate to it, you know, that idea that it mirrors the work, you know, using language. So you do, uh, ultimately, language begins as... <laughs> As transparent, you're trying to extract from it the thought and you're trying to extract from it what is useful to you at a particular moment because we, we never go into these things without an agenda. Um, so, but, you know, when you come back, just as you come back to a film, you say, oh, my God, you know, and actually that, that, that's how it's done. You know, that, look, look at that. Look at the... And Victor would... I said earlier on, Victor was not a fast writer. I say the least, and he would, Victor laboured over his prose. I mean, his, it's very difficult to imagine that because his writing seems so straightforward. He doesn't use jargon. It's one of the great things about Victor. His language is very straightforward. It's very easily understood. It's not to say that the thought is necessarily easy, but that, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't bewilder you. But he would take a very long time to arrive at those formulations. You know, they're chiselled out in a way. Um, they don't trip off the tongue. You know, the, the academic and non-academic thing is quite interesting. I mean, might might be a little digression here, but um, no, please. Victor began. I mean, when when movie was um, established in 1962, it was before there was really any significant academic. Um, field of, for the study of film. I think America probably, you know, the US probably began uh, a little before Britain, but, you know, it really wasn't until well, the very late 60s and then very emphatically in the 1970s that you start to get a kind of significant body of academic work and a lot of institutions getting into the field. I mean, in Britain, it really began with the universities and only in the, the 1970s and then it spread quite quickly. So Victor began writing, not in an academic context at all, although he argues in one of his very earliest essays, which is a a ferocious critique of something that was published by the British Film Institute uh, called 50 Famous Films. He argues for a a systematic, detailed, academic criticism. He says, you know, if the British Film Institute isn't producing this, you know, who is? Um, And they're not. But... So he begins with movie, which is not remotely an academic journal. It's a journal. It's a it's a magazine um, for the general re- the general reader who is seriously interested in film. And the writing in movie is deliberately accessible. And then Victor sustained that. I mean, he moved into academia, and he's one of the early academics and you know one of the first first waves very small wave of people who became full-time teachers of film in higher education in britain but he sustained that always always as he did you know the you know the against so much of what was happening in the 70s victor maintained the critical impulse but also the very strong emphasis on response you know that not on objectivity, you know, that response, not personal response, 
is important, but not just as personal, personal response that is then developed into argument and so on and so on, and then comes out and can be shared and can be questioned and passed on and so on. So the, the, the academic, non-academic, there's an interesting history in a sense mm-hmm. there. And I mean, it's, you know, Robin Wood similarly had very similar sort of beginnings to Victor and the early books that Robin Wood published. They're very, they, they don't come out of academic publishing, they come out of trade publishing, you know, they're for, kind of for everybody. And was very resistant, Robin Wood, very resistant to academic writing. <laughs> right. Anyway. So, so that was a bit of a digression. But in a way, it's not because I think that I see mirrored in that. And one of the things I appreciated most was this this sense of history that you provide in your introduction, and also seeing how Victor is also responding to Peter people like Peter Wollen. That the essay he wrote in response to the uh, Peter Wollen's Autorist article, I really changed how I was thinking of autorism. But the the kind of debate between academic non academic debates within the field in a way i see a lot of that in the videographic criticism arena today in which we are trying to figure out you know in the latest issue of the cinephiles there are articles by there's an article by kevin ferguson and drew morton kind of talking about how to use videographic criticism in tenure reviews and in, in applying to jobs and things so there are debates now on trying to figure out how this work fits into the the academic as you say because on one hand you know a, a video like like yours John Gibbs, you know, it's published in a journal, but it also exists on Vimeo where it can meet a, a wider audience who, who can enjoy it and who, who I know has um, enjoyed it. So to me, that, that this question of audience is, is very much in line with everything that you just described. Yes. I mean, you know, the, clearly the, there is a huge, a huge set of, of institutional as well as intellectual problems around the scholarly Right, as the, as the you know, scholarly videographic work of the cinephiles um, issue is extremely interesting. I think mm-hmm. I like Patrick Keating's contributions to that very much, but I've read quite a number of those. And um, I mean, the, the you know part of the problem is that of course these things are as much institutional as they are anything else, and institutions tend to be extraordinarily conservative. So I mean, in Britain. There is this thing called the research, well, it used to be called the research assessment exercise, now called something else, where universities have to have their research, which largely means their publications kind of assessed and, and money flows um, or used to flow, flows less freely now, as a, you know, on the results of that. And certainly, John, I know, has, I think, I can't remember whether I was still working full time. Probably not. But John has certainly submitted some of the videographic work that we've done right. for that. And I would certainly argue that the, the work that we've done sits perfectly comfortably with the written work that we've done. Yes. But of course, the work that the videographic work that, that operates in a different register to ours would need to argue these things differently. Right. Absolutely. And we all, you know, because we all. You know, academics need jobs. They've got to find ways of squeezing through the institutional keyholes. I, I want to m- move on a, a little bit here to um, one thing I, I mentioned in my email to you was that I was a like like I assume many people uh, and a big admirer of one essay in this volume uh, called Moments of Choice, which is an essay that I'm sure many people are are, are familiar with, and I think is an essay that if, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to go seek out one essay to read maybe before you you buy the book. This this might be the one you would want to pick. And I, there was one line in, in particular, and, and I'd, I'd appreciate if you maybe would give us a little introduction and history into this essay, because you'll be able to do it far, far greater than I can. But it was, directors were paid to believe, and, and Victor in this is talking about directors in the old Hollywood system, to believe that every little thing mattered and to prove it by their results. He's talking about every little thing in, in the image, in the scene, I think one of the sometimes the criticisms of videographic criticism, and this could this could also relate to film criticism more generally, is that sometimes video essays tend to focus on what a, what someone who is, does not appreciate the form or is skeptical of it might call like unnecessary minutia, like they are they are giving the director too much credit for this, and then they're they're exploring it in the video essay and they're getting too meta, as someone might uh, criticize them for being. And and I, I think this video essay provides a great pushback against someone who might say that 
they're getting too meta. And so I'd, I'd ask you about it and how you, give us ge- general history and how we might use it to think about criticism and I guess videographic criticism specifically. Well, I uh, kind of two things, I think two things coming out of what you've just said. I mean, mm-hmm. one, the first one is to really to do with the, you know, the, the director, giving the director too much credit as the, you know, the, the hypothetical critic uh, of, of this work. You don't, in doing detailed criticism, you may, but you don't need to attribute everything to the director. Well, in fact, you'd be mad to attribute everything <laughs> to the director. Right. Director is a coordinating, is a coordinating figure. He brings together, she brings together and, and coordinates and synthesizes, assuming the director is any good. Um, but even if they're not, actually, they'll do it at a very basic, you know, conventional level. The, the creative inputs of everybody else. So, but you don't have to constantly labor the director. What you're looking at ultimately is the effects of the film. The, the, the film, we all know, is, is a product of, of intense and extraordinarily complicated collaboration. Second thing is about minutiae. It seems to me that, you know, the, the detail is just, at one level, detail is just detail. Minutiae is just minutiae, you know. I look at the image of you on the screen. I know your listeners won't be able to see it, um, but Will has a, 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 a lamp um, behind him against the wall, which is casting some very nice shadows. I think, you know, uh, clearly the lighting man and the art director got together very cleverly here. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I know from the context in which we're talking that while I see the lamp and I rather like the shadows and the, you know, the way in which the patterns work on the wall, I know they're not relevant, they're not significant to what we're doing. When you're reading a film, when you're, when you're, when you're watching a film, you're in a completely different world. You know, there, is, uh, the, the, there are various forms of response, but you know, you're, it's an aesthetic object, as it were. You know? So it works aesthetically, it works as art. And there will be some things like, you know, the, the fact that there's a human being in the middle of the image that will immediately appear more important than a book on the shelf behind them or a lamp that's against the wall. But the, the effect that that image, that shot, that sequence is having on you comes from the relationship of all those things. So... If I then decide this being a film, not a, not a basis for a podcast, that I want to talk about the lamp, I would want to make an, a, a case aesthetically for the relationship of that lamp to the overall effect of the image and that the relationship of that effect to wider patterns of the movie. Now, there are a lot of such lamps in the movie. You know, I mean... It's a very crass um, kind of examples. But so at one level, detail is simply nothing. You know, detail is just detail. But an, an, any detail, any detail, the color of my shirt, the fact that I'm wearing glasses, the fact that you've got a light of a certain kind, any detail can become significant, can have an effect within the patterning of a whole created image which is the product of an enormous number of different choices, decisions that have been taken. So I wouldn't want to argue for the necessary significance of minutiae. I'd only want to detail, I only want to argue for it in terms of a reasoned argument that's based on that idea that in any image that creates for us the relationship between things is what's producing the effect. And in order to understand that, you need at one level to unpick and to sort of to, to work through what you take to be the significance of those decisions. Right. Yeah, does that? Yeah. No, it, it absolutely does. And this, this notion of unpicking the image and, and seeing the relationship between everything in the image I think that is the that that is the should be the goal of every critic. And in a in a way I actually think that think about the correct way to phrase this. That should be what the videographic critic does almost always because he or she is working with the 
working with the image. I mean, when they're, I mean, they might be going for a different form of criticism or something, but we're talking about this kind of detailed style based criticism. But I also think that sometimes the, the kind of the, uh, not to be too insulting, but kind of the, the the worst form of videographic criticism is one in which the image is merely illustrating whatever the argument is, and the argument is not specifically commenting on the image itself and what is happening in the image. There's, but I I, I ask this because Victor makes an important point in not only in moments of choice, but throughout the um, part two, which is film criticism, principles of practice, which is an entire, which is an entire section of thinking through how, when we look at an image, it's not, and and I, I would like you to kind of help me think through how to describe this. For example, in the film authorship, the premature burial essay, he's talking about my darling Clementine, which is one of my favorite films. Me too. And, yeah, just I, I love it so much. I made a video essay about it, in part inspired by moments of choice. So this is why I'm I'm making, I'm making this about me here. But at the t- but at the end at the end of that film, there's a fence that is kind of sitting in between Wyatt Earp and Clementine, and Victor talks about how there are a lot of fences in the work of Ford and in that film in particular. You know, Victor Mature dies out of at a fence in that film and everything. But he's not saying in pointing to the significance of the fence, he's not saying that Ford put the fence there to like in a in an incredibly deliberate way to say, I use fences in my work. So therefore I want the fence to be right there specifically for this. Like Ford is working with a bunch of people and Ford has an aesthetic that presumably the people who are working with him are aware of. And so you, you, you said to me in your email that Victor is incredibly precise in his language. So when we talk about these director's choices, how should we describe something like the significance of a fence without saying that Ford, you know, put the fence in the ground himself and said, I want it right here for this reason, X, Y, and Z. Like, how do we make that distinction? It's a distinction at one level, which is, um, you, you know, it's about intention. Is it, you know, or you can, you, can, you, you can frame it as a... a and it's, it's something that crops up a lot in, in early student work, um, doesn't it? You know, you know that, oh, could, the, could, they, could the director, could Hitchcock really have meant that? You know, is that, that, that you'll have heard this, this familiar skeptic. It's very good to have the skeptical voice, you know. And, and you, you, want, you, you know, you might be talking about the representation of, 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 of women, you know, more broadly. You know, Can, is, is, this Hitch, is this in Hitchcock's mind? Yeah, <laughs> And you want to say, well, of course not. You know, what, what Hitchcock is doing is making a film. You know, what Ford is doing is making a movie. He's focused on what, what is needed for that movie and what is within that movie needed for that scene. But he's working, they're working as creative artists. So the, the, it's not that they're working without intention. They're working with levels of very elaborate intention but they're not levels of intention which require them to rationalise in the way that a critic or a theorist rationalises. So I think Victor says of that moment in My Darling Clementine, um, words to the effect that, you know, I mean, it's not that Ford deliberately put it there for a point, but he would have been bloody angry if somebody put the wrong kind of fence there. You know, so it, he doesn't want, it is not wanting people to be a mutt, to, be, to read his mind but to have a sense of what is appropriate. And he would have been very quick to say, no, not that kind of fence. And it's true, you know, you, if you look at the shot of, in Stagecoach, the very first shot of Monument Valley in Ford, in the whole of Ford, I think, it's the same kind of fence, the rough hewn fence stretching out beyond the settlements into the valley. So there is a pattern. Um, but I don't, I don't believe for a moment, you know, that Ford went around looking at styles of fence and saying, you know, he, it, it comes out of the process. These things come out of the process, working with the same people over and over again, you know. They, but, yeah, if the fence had been in the wrong place, he'd have said that's in the wrong place. So we've got to move the camera, you know. But, I mean, I think, you know, what you're picking up is exactly kind of what... How, how you, you started really wanting to talk about Victor's work. The value of Victor's work for videographic criticism is, you know, a moment like that, or in moments of choice, he opens with a description of aspects of the sleigh ride scene in The Magnificent Amazons, Orson Welles' film, 
And he says he insisted on, build, this is the opening of the essay, he insisted on building his set inside the largest available refrigeration plant. Now, for God's sake, you know, this is <laughs> absolutely below zero. It's going to freeze people to death. Landscape he required could not have been simulated RKO, da 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 da. Why does he want it? Why does he want this completely crazy thing to do? He wants it because he wants to see the breath of the actors. You say, oh my God, what, I mean, what enormous trouble to go to, to <laughs> see the little puffs of breath in the, in the frozen air. And then he develops the argument of how the breath of the actors relates can be related to you know the exhausts of the of, of these early automobiles and so on you know so it's it, it it feels as though it might at one level be could be accused of being you know taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut for god's sake <laughs> poor son you know spending all this money going to a refrigeration plant just for that and no it's not just for that it's for the whole effect, the ways in which the image, the, the elements of the image will interact, even down to, I think, as he says at some point, I probably can't find it now, you know, the very breath of the actors, the, um, you know, that it just, there it is and it's gone. There it is and it's gone. But then juxtaposed with this great belching, smoky exhalation from and other things. So, and I mean, that is one among so many examples in the book as a whole of moments that you could imagine forming the basis of a piece of videographic criticism. Absolutely. Well, you, you watch the scene, you, you play the scene, and then you gradually, gently, subtly, as Victor does, unpick it. And right show the significance of it you know i mean and as i say there, there are so many there's a very there's an early one that i had marked i'm trying to see where it is um from one of the early essays on nicholas words from the little essay on um 55 days at peking this is page 181 for those of you who have your <laughs> your copy. <laughs> a little really. read along, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, he says this, I'll, I'll just read a bit of it. But Peking, like any other Ray movie, is full of moments in which characters, attitudes, or emotions are concentrated into their most direct visual form. Thus, the years of rejection and uncertainty which have marked the childhood of Teresa played by Lin Su Moon, orphan daughter of a Chinese woman and an American soldier, are, are summarized in one characteristic gesture, the arm tentatively outstretched towards any possible source of acceptance and security. And then the, the one that I particularly like, or again, Matt Lewis, this is the Charlton Heston character, Matt Lewis's quick glance at Natalie, Ava Gardner's, Nat, Natalie's extravagant dress is enough to contradict for us her claim that she is not in uniform and to change the significance of Matt's reply, I like fine the way things are. Now, you know, that, if, if you can't see the, the moment there. Put it up on the screen, put it up, in a, you know, make a, make a piece of videographic criticism. And you, is this true? Is it, I mean, does, does that, that's a fantastically wonderful claim about this little tiny moment and the way in which his look changes the significance. I mean, you know, it begs to be put up on the screen. Victor does that time and time again. Mm. But what, again, what, what, he, what, what he asks you to do, and this becomes very um, explicit in some of the later essays, including another, number, another essay, which I know you like very much, his very last one on high school, Mm -hmm. Frederick Wiseman's high school. He says, you know, um, in effect, this is not this this argument is not asking you simply to accept it. You know, what it's asking you to do is to go away and watch the film again and see the extent to which what I've written is true to the film and enriches your understanding of the film. And that further viewing of the film may also enable you to say, well, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> Not quite. 
uh, you know, well, you can't argue back with the writer of a book, but it can take your thinking further because, again, for Victor, it's constantly criticism invites a dialogue and, you know, and, and therefore kind of it has a life beyond the words on the page. It's not simply saying, take what I say as gospel. Yes. <laughs> it's, absolutely, it's absolutely not that. Go back and look at the film. Go back right. and look at the film. Right. And but there are so yeah. many, like, so many pieces like that. But you, I know you wanted to get back to moments of choice. Well, no, I mean, I think this this is to keep going here. I, I, I think this could be a good time to talk about high school, the essay on high school, because you just mentioned it. But t- to your point, this this idea of n- never in his writing, even though he f- he seems very sure of himself, and it's not that he's he's not you know just making claims and then saying oh well go check it out for yourself. It's being sure of what he believes and what his feeling is in the, in the personal. But it is it does feel as though you're you're being invited into. To, to, to go double check and get find for yourself in your own interpretation. And I think, you know, we keep tying it back to videographic criticism, but that to me, that is what videographic criticism is all about because you are, you are putting it out online, which is built for this type of conversation, uh, whether it's a literal comment box or in sharing on Facebook and in Twitter. And it's, and like I said, it, this, this, this text does such a good job of showing us how Victor thought about his work, but also how he thought about it in relation to other other movements in film criticism that were going on at the time. And he's quoting from Pauline Kael, but also from other people who perhaps more associated in the Academy. And it really feels like this blending together of the entire film ecosystem of the time in which he was working. Well, yeah, I mean, that's interesting because, you know, he was working well across many, many years, you know, from, from 1960 almost up to the almost up to the present, but um, he didn't publish consistently across that period. You'll have noticed in the book, you know, that the first part takes us up to 1970-something, and then the next part picks it up with moments of choice, 1981. And in a sense that, you know, so he's not in constant dialogue, although he was teaching and talking and throughout that time, when I worked with him through most of the 1970s when... He wasn't publishing ex- extensively, well, or hardly at all, joining in discussions, uh, movie and so on. But it coincides, of course, with the rise of screen criticism and the big attacks on um, him, uh, Robin Wood, you know, and others that came um, with screen at the beginning of the 1970s. But, um, but, but you're right, you know, in... in, in he engages in debates as m- movie provoked debates in the 60s. Pauline Kael was one of the people who responded <laughs> and they responded to Pauline Kael and so on and so on. So there's a kind of, you know, it, it, it was John Gibbs has written a very good book based on his PhD about the development of post World War II British film criticism. And he traces those debates really interestingly. Hmm. Pauline Kael, yeah. And then later on, there are some of the bigger essays in the second half, as you say, takes on the text Peter Wallen, mm-hmm. Peter Wallen's version of, of Auteur. Right. And that article Auteurs. wasn't until 1990, right? So that would have been no, much right. after. It's late. It's yeah, late. it would have been much after. Much, right, yeah, yeah. Much later. And and the Boardwell, you know. The, right, the, yeah. The, the, which again begins with the most one of the most wonderful sustained pieces of criticism on the opening of Max Ophels's call. Well, it's not the opening, sorry, a tiny little fragment, about 15 seconds of Max Ophels's court. And he uses that as the basis for developing an argument against David Baldwell on interpretation. I should say something else about Moments of Choice, sure, yeah, um, yeah. which you I mean, um, it's the first piece in the second half of the book. And so it's, it's um, and it was written not for an academic publication. It was written not for movie, which was, was appearing very intermittently after about 19, mid-1970s, continued, but very intermittently, for, for financial reasons, essentially. It was written for the movie. Now, the movie was was fascinating publication, but it was a part work. 
you know, parts that came out regularly, you, you buy them in news agents, you know, they have other series which are on, you know, how to take care of your car or what, whatever, or, <laughs> yeah. or history, you know, the history yeah. of World War Two. So it was that, and it, I mean, it actually some very interesting writers wrote for the movie, quite difficult to get hold of now, but and Victor wrote Moments of Choice. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether he was invited, he, very likely was. Victor always used to say he was only he he only wrote when he was either invited or you know there was an occasion <laughs> for, for for writing. Um, so so it's absolutely not intended for um, an academic audience. Brilliant piece of academic writing actually. But so he and that's the reason I think particularly that he takes us through the argument about direction so um in, in such a kind of systematic way right emphasizing choice you know the, and and taking us into the the work of the of the director with examples from about half a dozen um different directors mainly hollywood but there's a wonderful passage on um, jean renoir's la regle du jeu mm. as well Sorry, I just wanted to, that's a contextual thing, but quite important about moments of choice, I think. No, and I thank you for that. And, and it makes it makes complete sense. And I think is definitely an important context to understand kind of what he was hoping to achieve and who he was trying to reach with the piece. Well, one question I actually meant to ask you that I don't, that I was thinking as I was kind of rereading and reading last night. Throughout this book and his work, he returns to not only the same filmmakers again and again, Max Ophels, of course, and Nicholas Ray, but also specific films. I mean, Psycho is mentioned. I don't have a specific question, but just what do we make of that? As it, Is this him using films that he's most familiar with to illustrate a principle, or is he working through his understanding of films that he enjoys or appreciates in a bunch of different ways and that's why they appear or maybe it's none of the above maybe it's a combination of both it is absolutely you're absolutely right I mean, one of the things about victor's writing is that he ultimately does focus on a, a very small focuses, focuses very intently on a small number of of directors and um, in the second part of the book here, it's notably Max Ophels and Nicholas Ray. Now, Nicholas Ray was one of the very first directors that Victor celebrated um, back in, uh, initially in when he was writing for, for a journal called Oxford Opinion, which, uh, Oxford University. He wrote his first piece about Nicholas Ray back then, about 1960. And then... Um, a later piece for movie uh, on the cinema of Nicholas Ray and, and some individual pieces for movie as well. Um, and I don't know at what point Victor began, or that Victor discovered for himself Ray. It may well have been much earlier on. He was an inveterate cinema going goer from a very early age. But he was passionate about Ray as a director. Um, he thought Ray was a genius as a director. And somebody, of course, who'd had a complicated um, Hollywood career and a very turbulent personal life as well. Anyway, and he came to know Nicholas Ray uh, really quite well later on. And they became really quite friendly. And in fact, they wrote a film script together, a rather um, quite a horror film. It's quite, it's, it, it's quite... Quite horrible. <laughs> <laughs> was it made? Was it made? No, it was. It was okay. never made. Um, <laughs> some um, Polly was was kind of wondering about um, whether it might, it might pub. It might be possible to publish the script, but mm -hmm. I think you know that there's. It's sort of partly Victor's, partly the estate of Nicholas Ray. And, right. But yeah, so he came to know Ray. Wow. And Ray was very appreciative of of. Um, of Victor's writing about him, undoubtedly. So he returned to Ray, and then in the second half of the book, there are the two pieces, one on Johnny Guitar and um, In a Lonely Place, of course, a wonderful, wonderful essay on In a Lonely Place, both mm. utterly brilliant. Ophuls, I think he probably discovered quite early on because 
I think, although he didn't write about him extensively for many years, the first half of his career, hardly at all, though Victor did write the scripts for a television series, for schools television series, in the late 1960s, which we have the scripts for. And um, uh, it's a remarkable piece of work in itself, but I, I won't go there. But I think within that, there are references to letter and unknown woman. Mm. But Ophels was, you know, w- 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 such a crucial thing. But the thing, and Vince was often, could be criticised for those hostile to his work for being apparently so narrow. Right. But you know what, I mean, what you said about kind of enriching his own understanding, I mean, that is very much how he's, I'm sure that's very much how he saw it. Right. He did teach these directors, these films, many, many times. Um, I mean, a lot of us do that in academia, you know, partly for, um, for for an easy life, partly for, you know, pressures of time. Right. With Victor, it was a process of constant learning, you know, the, the sense that, he, and he loved these films. I mean, he's passionate about them. Difficult to exaggerate, you know, to exaggerate Victor's passion for, for the movies that he loved. And he genuinely, through the interaction with students and so on, found more and more and more to say about them. That, that, you know, his, his understanding of them became enriched. Mm. So he, said he, just, he just kept coming back to them. As you see, you know, there are a number of essays on Letter from Unknown Woman in the second half, and they're all remarkable. And they're remarkable in a number of different ways, one of which is always there's detailed criticism, you know, that work, that, that detail that feeds so readily, could feed so readily into the videographic mm-hmm. field. But it's also that he sees, he, 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 and this could take us to high school, each of those essays begins with something unexpected. The first right. one, he writes about a sequence, the Lintz sequence in Letter from a Woman, which hardly anybody had written about before. And he says, you know, sequence that always seemed, it seemed, I can't remember the words that he used, but, you know, not particular, you know, ex- kind of extraordinary because Ophels is, but not remarkable in the way that some other things immediately seem. And he takes that, I mean, and it, it's an extraordinary piece. So he works through that and its relationships to the rest of the film in, in great detail. The second of the essays, if I remember rightly, certainly one of the others, he just picks up the fact that in the book of Letter and a Woman, the setting is one city, I can't remember the, not the, it's the other city, and it's moved for the film to Linz in Austria. And he develops that into an argument about Linz and Hitler and into the way in which, in the film, you get this kind of opposition between different kinds of music, and in particular between Wagner, Hitler's favourite composer, and Mozart. So there's a wonderful kind of political, you know, it's an argument about the politics of the period that actually, he argues, finds its way into Letter and I Woman. I don't think anybody else would have picked up on that. And then high school, of course, well, my God, you know. (laughs) He picks up on something in high school that had simply never been noticed before. He hadn't noticed it for decades, working with the film. So you want to go on from there? Sure. And, and, and thank you for that. And I think it, it's such an interesting thing because I identify that in myself, this obsession with one film or a group of films and just keep going back to the well again and again and again and again. And I think Victor's work provides such a inspiration for how, how, how you can continue to do that. And, um, in a way, I think in so, in some ways it's even harder, you know, how, how can I squeeze something new out of this again and again and again, you know, um, and so it's beautiful. But yes, to, to talk about high school and and 
it's funny because in reading this essay, I was reminded of, and we talk about kind of this battle between the movie uh, critics and the screen critics. I was reminded of Laura Mulvey's death 24 times a second and kind of some of the themes that she talks there. Victor covers in this essay. And again, I, I would appreciate you to for you to introduce this essay and to provide a little context. But essentially, Victor discovers this moment how the film ends. And specifically, uh, there's a high school principal who's reading a letter from someone who's just gone off to Vietnam and she's reading it to the school. It's her. There's this kind of uh, the music and the final image of the film are not synced up in the last frame. And it was something that he did not notice, I believe, until he had gotten the film on DVD or on VHS and was able to kind of play around with it and watch it. The high school principal, the, 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 the woman, um, finishes her the, the speech. And right. I think her last line, um, uh, it's, it's a kind of, you know, isn't this kind of, isn't this so sort of line, I can't remember it exactly. And the sound is dropped at that moment. Wiseman very briefly drops the sound and then the image fades out and the film ends. And he says, yes, you know, um, it's a moment that... The last words are, I think you will agree with me. That's the one. I think you will agree with me. Yes. <laughs> and the sound is dropped. You don't hear, as Victor says, what you, you don't hear is the audience response. She's, she's speaking to an audience. You don't hear them applauding. You don't hear them making any audible, you know, as they well might have done. And he ponders... <laughs> the significance of a decision that no writer on the film had noticed, that he hadn't noticed, yes, until he was able to stop and start the movie. A decision which is very clearly a decision, you know, not something that could have happened by accident. It's a decision. And yet a decision that was clearly designed not to be noticed and yet to have an effect. And he says, doesn't he, at some point, you know, the, the, the last thing that Wiseman would have wanted was anybody to say, hey, he's dropped the sound. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're not supposed to notice it. And yet it's the last moment of the film. And so and, and he develops from that, going back, you know, from it and out and back to it and out an extraordinary argument about the nature of the film and particularly that section of the film in which the principal is is reading the letter and talking to the faculty and whoever else is there about this this young man. And it becomes, the, the, the piece becomes a kind of meditation ultimately on a whole range of things, including detailed criticism, Right. <laughs> including the place of the newer technologies that allow us, to, you know, going back to, to Laura on Laura Malby on such things, you know, that, that allow us to stop, start to experience movies in ways that they were never designed to be experienced. And I, did, I, I end the introduction actually with a, with a quite lengthy quotation from the end of that essay which is really about the responsibilities of criticism. And it's, it's a remarkable, I mean, it's the last thing they had published. Oh, wow. Um, so it's absolutely the last yeah. thing. So it, it, was, it was a piece he'd, he'd done as a conference paper, and I think might even have done as a conference paper more than once, I'm not sure. I certainly heard it on one occasion. So it had been around for a time and he'd been work. you know, like so often, you know, Victor had been living with this film on and off, teaching it coming back to it, and then suddenly, and, and I think the argument even, you know, for, for after the, he delivered some of the papers, the argument developed, he discovered. Uh, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary example of the way in which Victor can and does, in some of those later essays, begin with something which seems positively kind of left field, you know. Right. <laughs> what, what? This is the tiniest bit of minutiae you could identify, isn't it? You know, the dropping of sound for a matter of seconds. And, and he weaves from that uh, this extraordinary essay about criticism and about Wiseman and about the film. 
then about American back. life, the Vietnam War, how we oh, there are all those things yeah. come out come out of the material. You know, right. the, the, the Dr. Haller is is speaking, and that the film deals with, and so on. But but he eventually comes back, doesn't he, to that to, to those issues to do with um, criticism and to do with responsibility. You know, he says to, right at the end. This is quite often a further viewing will be both possible and enriching. So this is the point that we were making earlier on about he wants you to go back to the film. We may then see an offered reading as convincing, revelatory, merely credible, or not even that. The question will need to be addressed through lively interrogation of our renewed experience. You know, this is the constant thing. In this process of introspection, we shall at our best be alert what we can truthfully say and mean. And that emphasis on what we can truthfully say and mean about the film, that comes out partly out of that discussion of the of what DVD and other technologies enable you to do, which is to stop the movie. You know, you can very easily um, distort, I think, you know, right. I'm not sure that's the word he uses, but you can very easily distort the movie, the ex true experience of the movie and the balance of the movie by overemphasizing something that emerges only, can only emerge from you stopping starting like that. So you've got to go back constantly to the experience of the movie as it, as it exists in time, the movie right. as it's intended to be experienced. And that would would it be so? Would it be correct in reading? And this is how I, I I took this last section to kind of be a, a warning to the to the critic as they encounter these new digital technologies, to, to kind of the need to now that we have this increased access to as you say, go back and double check everything that we're thinking and feeling as we watch. Is is that how you understand? The argue, the, what he is trying to say is yeah, this a warning? Yeah, I mean, he doesn't. He's not hectoring, but but right. I think it's 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 a we could say it's a kind of cautionary note. I mean, it's more than a note, but it, it is it is a word of caution about what those technologies allow us to do, and that would be true, of course, um, e even well, not even more, but that would be equally true of videographic criticism. You know, what you, you can stop, you can start, you can overlay, you can slow down, you can speed up, you can, so that the, and those things can be very illuminating, can produce all sorts of fascinating new knowledge about the film, but they all take you away from the experience of the movie as it was intended to be experienced, you know, and right. um, so Vic, Vic, what, what, what he wants to say is, well, I think he says at some point, let me just see if I can find it. Yes, about these technologies, um, so what is more certain is they involve a radical interference with the film and the way in which it was intended to play. In the pre-digital era, movies were made to be seen under what we call cinema conditions. As a result, the use of time, space, continuity was the work of the movie alone. Films were not seen in isolated fragments. Nobody mistook a trailer for a movie etc cetera, etc cetera. i love that line yeah <laughs> yes it makes for an experience distinct from that of any ordinary viewing when one acquires the ability to pause part pause start freeze skip forward or back we should ask what safeguards should be put on our close readings when the control of time has been stolen from the artist in the interests of study Mm -hmm. what control so it is very much a cautionary note you know right um not saying you don't discover the most wonderful things you clearly you do like the dropping of sound at the, at the end of the movie which you didn't notice for decades and which nobody else had but then you have to kind of put it back into the into the context of the film and find ways of of, of not of, of using it in ways that don't distort the film and the and the nature of the filmmaker's decision. Which the filmmaker's decision wasn't, "Hey, I've dropped the sound." You know, it was something else entirely. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a remarkable ending. Sincerity and introspection have not been terms privileged in the philosophy of film. He says, "But close reading cannot prosper without them." So yeah, so that we come back to that 
where we started, you know, with detail. He ends the book, or the book ends, his last piece ends, with that term, close reading. Sincerity right. and introspection have not been privileged terms in the philosophy of film, but close reading cannot prosper without them. And that is a cautionary note, isn't it? I mean, indeed, there's a lot of, there is a lot of work out there, and I'm sure we've all done some of it, you know, which <laughs> does distort, which just doesn't quite heed the caution. What you say reminds me, when we talk about videographic criticism, there, it operates, I think, after a number of critical and artistic tradition, one of which is the found footage film. And a lot, many found footage filmmakers are reappropriating material to make something new in that the goal of the found footage filmmaker is not the goal necessarily of the videographic critic. And I think sometimes we conflate these two. And, and what you're saying about detailed criticism, I think, is relates to this argument in the sense that if we are to produce an object of videographic criticism, there may be times where we where we do both, where we want to take the raw material and turn it into something new, or we want to use the raw material to say something about the original object. And I think sometimes these two things get conflated, or it's not clear which the other is trying to do. And I know a lot of found footage filmmakers, or not a lot, but but I think they want to be very clear you know, we we talk about found footage filmmaking sometimes on the, in, on this podcast, and they want to be be clear that they are not when they appropriate the work of Hitchcock or whomever. Like they're using that to create their own film. They're not trying to say, oh, um, they're not trying to comment on the original material. Inevitably, it might provide some kind of commentary, but that's not its aim. And it kind of reminds me of the distinction that you and that Victor is making um, here. I, I know very little about the found footage film, but it seems to me that and other creative. Uh, other uses of found material, whether movie or anything else, in other artistic spheres, for the purposes of creating something that clearly is going to have a relationship to the original, but is actually, uh, it, it is a, a work of art in its own right. That seems to me entirely honourable, entirely appropriate. You know, that's art, in some sense, has always been made out of other art. Found The found footage film is an extreme example of that. <laughs> you, t- you actually, you know, and that that perfectly perfectly legit that seems to be perfectly legitimate. I mean, whether the work is any good becomes a different matter altogether. You know that as it would for anything. But criticism is something different. Cri- criticism has to be responsible to the work it is attempting to elucidate and interpret or evaluate or you know whatever the emphases are of the the, the, the writer in question. And that, you know, that there is another debate within videographic criticism that uh, <coughs> Chris Keithley has been quite heavily involved in from early on, which is about the poetic. And again, um, I haven't followed this devoutly, but I, it, it sets off little warning bells. <coughs> Not because um, criticism doesn't use what might be thought of as poetic. I, I prefer the term rhetoric, really. I mean, written criticism it all, uh, inevitably draws on rhetoric. I mean, we have to be very careful. But of course we did. You know, it's persuasive. You know, it, it uses persuasive language. It ha- but, and, it, and, and indeed metaphor, you know, I mean, it uses language, it can use language metaphorically, but at the service of. So I sort of... And the same, I think, is true. Video was one of the things that John and I found when we were making our own work, that the, the, the videographic things that we've done together, a very small number of them, but we, what we found was as, as you begin to juxtapose things, you know, then, then kind of little sparks happen. There is certainly what, what emerges, whether well, often quite unintentionally, but, but, but then very usefully, is a sort of, it's like a, 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 almost like a little level of, of the poetic or the, the metaphorical or what, you know, the, the, the image becomes charged in a different way to the rational, uh, the way of rational argument. I'm, that, that, I'm fine with that. But how much further do you go before you're really saying, I'm making an, a piece of independent creative work? And that's just why, you know, Rather boringly, I always want to add criticism to the, you know, videographic criticism. Um, I much prefer that to to essay, which is a very floppy term, I think. 
So you always want to say videographic criticism or video. But, you know, then as soon as you say video, you tend, you tend to add essay. So the clunkier term so always feels to me more, well, it, it may be that it simply says more about the way that I want to use videographic or, you know, the, the videographic work. And it, and it may say simply more about the work that I value right. um, within the field that I've seen, which isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note would be a great way to end our conversation, this distinction between the the poetic and the explanatory, as you mentioned. And I couldn't agree with you more on videographic criticism. The video essay podcast, the name for it came out of it to be less clunky. But so I have my own <laughs> issues with that. I'm perpetuating a term that I perhaps would not prefer that we use. And I, and I, um, but we all do I that. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I just think that because, because you can't go around simply using clunky terms all, all the right. time. It's just a matter of, isn't it? Of, um, when you want to be reasonably precise, you can diverge from the video, video essay. Video essay, video right. essay is the the umbrella the, term. It's the catch-all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then within that, if you're trying to define, well, anyway, we've been there. Douglas Pye, thank you so much for coming on the show for a great conversation. VF Perkins on movies, collected shorter film criticism. Great book. And again, we'll link to everything um, at thevideoessay.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really, it has been a pleasure. 